Hey y'all, it's Courtney. And it's Sarah. And welcome to part two of Flowers in the Attic. If you have, uh, if you don't know us and you are just starting with this, you missed part one. We only had to split them up for time. Go back and listen to part Stop one. Stop the tape and go back. If you want to, uh, if you don't care, I don't know, whatever. I don't care. But <laughs> this part, we're going on a serious nostalgia train ride, but... There's some, a couple little warnings before we, you know, embark. Because we had originally done content warnings for Flowers in the Attic, the first book in V.C. Andrews' Dolling Ganger series. Uh, more shit happens in the rest of the series, and we have an expert come and tell us about it. Yes, so in this episode, we have our expert, Sarah Garrett, uh, local to Columbia, South Carolina, lawyer by day, V.C. Andrews, Expert by super night. Fan. Yeah, super fan by night. So, so we don't go into like a lot of detail about any of these particular events, but you need to know about them if you're somebody who is particularly sensitive to any of this stuff. So basically, the rule of thumb is if there's anything that might upset you that you might have need a trigger warning for... We'll catch you on the flip side. No. It's going <laughs> to happen in this series. You're not going to listen to this. Anything that you can think of that might be upsetting happens in the Dolling Ganger series. Nobody fucks a goat. Well, however, we don't really go into details on these things. We just kind of talk about them as plot points. So there's not a lot of time spent on them. The one thing that we do, or that rather I spend time on, is I talk about the death of a child because this is something that I have experienced. So I talk about it in terms of grief. I don't give everyone the whole gory, like, details of things. Not that it was gory, but I don't lament for 20 minutes about the situation. I talk about it in terms of grief. So it is something that is mentioned. We definitely know that there are some people yeah, who, who avoid don't want to hear that, that and that's so fine. Again, I talk about it in kind of the lens of a personal experience. Um, again, everything else, the Dolling Ganger series is straight up bananas. So <laughs> if you think you might have a problem with it, maybe skip this and go listen to... <laughs> I can give you ninety nine percent invisible, right? Yeah, or Firestarters podcast, <laughs> which is an awesome podcast. Oh, yeah? breaking down every historical reference <laughs> in Billy Joel's "We Didn't Start the Fire." What? They're kind of amazing. So if you think you're going to okay, be upset by us, or even if you're not going to be upset by us, you go listen cool to that. Firestarters podcast. I'm going to go listen to that now. I have not listened to it. It sounds awesome. Super fun. Um, well, I'm also going to warn you, if this sounds like it stopped abruptly, that's not your, like, uh, iPhone battery going down. That's because the SD card that powers our recorder gave the fuck up. We it, ran out of time. It gave it up on us. or anything. So, uh, yeah, it ends abruptly. But we were pretty much finally done. We <laughs> out. Happened. talks a recording device yes. so buckle up get ready for a nostalgia train we talk about all kinds of wild shit soap operas we almost kill sarah in this one too yeah i needed oxygen just about it was it was yes. rough it so because I, I i unfortunately was not a guiding light disciple we do talk about the guy if you're triggered me. by the guiding light then if you're you know a one life to live fan and hate the guiding light then you can fuck off to the next thing. But enjoy. <laughs> hey, y'all, we're back. Um, so, again, today's a little bit different because we have a very special guest. So I'm going to introduce my friend, Sarah Garrett. I've known Sarah since we were 22. 22? Yeah. 22. We met in graduate school. We both went to graduate school for public history. And... We were both hell raisers together. <laughs> Had a big old time. Sarah's like gone on and now she's in law and doing amazing things. But I brought her in because she read this book at the age that you're obviously supposed to read this book to love it. And we have this really nice kind of memory associated with Flowers in the Attic. So again, I've never read the book, but in 2001... Sarah and I were part of our graduate school program where we went and spent six weeks in England. And one afternoon, we were both hungover. I was probably a little more hungover than you were. I don't know. We were both hungover. And we sat in this English garden at the place, this Jacobean mansion that we were, like, staying at for two weeks to, like, do history stuff. Really, it was just, like, we're going to do a little bit of history stuff and party. Like, but we sat there in this amazing garden. The weather was perfect. And Sarah spent two hours recounting the entire 
Flowers in the Attic series to me. <laughs> so, like, not just the Flowers in the Attic, but the other books. So, she was, like, just telling me the story. So, I feel like, I, like, I feel like I've read it. <laughs> so, it was, like, one of my favorite memories. So, I thought she'd be good to come on and talk a little bit about this. It's also period appropriate because if you are of the right age to be... Like, really get our podcast. You were born, like, 79, 80, yeah. and your name is statistically Sarah. <laughs> so. so now we've got two. There's, there's, we've accreted another Sarah. So, yes, we have, a, we have a new Sarah with us. So, Sarah, can you give us a brief recap of the rest of the series? What happens to the Dollengangers? Sure. First, I just want to thank you both for having me on here. I'm such a big fan, and this is the ultimate treat for me to be yeah. on today. Oh. Um, but yes, to recap what happens after Flowers in the Attic, you have Petals on the Wind, and basically the children, the surviving children, Kathy, Christopher, and Carrie, have escaped to the attic. They've escaped Foxworth Hall, and they're on a bus headed south to Florida, apparently to join the circus. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. We're just going to let that pass. <laughs> no. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> So many questions. On the bus, um, an African-American lady named Henrietta, whose nickname is Henny, uh, finds them on the bus. Carrie is very sick, obviously, from the arsenic poisoning. And she gets them off the bus and takes them to her employer, who's a 40-year-old widower, Paul Sheffield, and he's a doctor. And so this is all in South Carolina, right? I and just want to point out, and this is <laughs> whenever in, we see South Carolina pop up in something. <laughs> yes, this is South up. Carolina. And... <laughs> I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kathy's probably around 15 at this point. I, th- I want to say she was 16 at the end 15, of the 15, 16. Yeah, well, I wrote it down. I left he my He was 18 work. at the end of Flowers in the Attic. He, and I think yeah, he was like, going to be separated from them, and that's so why. So, like 15, yeah. yeah. So, so, Kathy's still a teenager, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Paul's sure. 40. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Do you know what's oh, coming? Oh, yeah. no. So, I know what's coming. <laughs> So, add to her themes of, well, I don't want to give too much. Add, add to your themes of, of rape and incest. Add statutory rape. Oh, uh, no. Um, and, and suicide. At least they're not related. Oh, that's yeah. the last right? Yes, that's the thing. It's You're like, okay, at least they're not related. But anyway, so there there's a lot of chemistry and inappropriate things going on at between Paul and Kathy uh, basically, Christopher goes off to medical school. Kathy pursues her uh, dream and career in ballet, and Carrie is sent off to a boarding school where Mean <laughs> Girls, where <laughs> Mean Girls torture her. Poor Carrie. Her. Like, but at least she's out of the attic. Carrie, yes. Carrie, Nobody gives a shit about Carrie. Carrie, <laughs> Carrie can't catch a break. Honestly, yeah, I was so glad, I, you know, that that, that it wasn't Carrie who got. I, didn't, I, didn't get, I mean, but then Corey died, and I was like, Corey's the good one. I like Corey a lot. Carrie's just a little. Never mind. Okay. So, Forward. So Carrie or so Kathy um, is just an amazing ballerina, right? Mm-hmm. And so she's in this ballet school, and the and the teacher of the ballet school, her son comes in from New York. His name's Julian, and he's so dashing and so arrogant and such a good dancer. And of course, he's obsessed with Kathy. <laughs> and he had some sort of back injury. Um, when he was younger, and apparently she's the only ballerina that he can lift without having some serious. Well, she lost a lot of bone mass in the attic. Yes. <laughs> she's so frail. <laughs> so anyway, she ends up in New York with him, and you're really rooting for them, right? Because Julian is not her brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's a low bar. I mean, a really. low bar, like a ballet bar. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, yeah, it is low bar. You're really rooting for Julian, but he is just terrible. He's abusive. <laughs> oh. He is... I'm going to say, I kind of root for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know they're brother and sister, but again, like, I feel like the attic absolves you. Together, the, yeah. the attic absolves you of a lot of things. Like, you can be like, fuck it, I was locked up in an attic for three years. I do what I want. All right, continue. Sorry. sorry. You can only get away with that for so long. No, now. you can. You know, After a certain point, life you're like, Pass. When life were you pass. locked up in the attic? Oh, 48 years no, ago. No, I was in an attic. Okay, continue. Sorry. Well, Julian does horrible things to her, including breaking her toes. What is this? Uh, yeah. And, you know, their their sex life is really just sort of brutal and tumultuous, too. So, it's... <laughs> Kathy cannot get somebody to, like, you put it in right. You wouldn't catch a break, could you? You just couldn't say catch a break right there. So, <laughs> so um, Julian takes off. He has drinking 
issues and anger issues. He's very abusive. Oh, and he was messing with Carrie too on the side. Oh. So Carrie Carrie gets away from her school and comes Oh, out. I might need to go revise our trigger warning for this episode. Yeah. So so before so before yeah, he's he's got a thing for and Carrie's even younger than Kathy. Yeah. Okay. So Kathy and Julian Kathy and Julian are about the same age. It's it's maybe he's a little bit older than her. I can't remember exactly. He's not Paul old. Um, <laughs> so it's, I'm assuming at this point, though, Carrie is, like, a teenager earlier. Yeah, she's not, like, she's, a child she's, anymore, She's right? coming into puberty, and she has never... He, Julian is the first male who has ever shown any interest in her because she has I came into puberty when I was 11. Because isn't and she all, like, big-headed child. and small? Like, she's yeah. still big-headed and small. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she, well, I said she might have been a little bit, like, um, delayed, you know, because yeah, her again, body was she's not... She's big-headed and yeah. small. Yeah, she's... She might have been more like 18. I don't know. Yeah, she had some, some issues where people just were horrible to her, and Julian wasn't, but he took advantage of her. Um... But uh, he dies in a car accident with another ballet dancer, but not before he impregnated Kathy. And they did get married. Um, so Kathy comes back to South Carolina and uh, eventually marries Paul. But <laughs> the the weird thing, so many things about Paul, he's written to be like this stand-up guy, like this white male savior to everybody. Yeah, well, thank God he was fooling around with a 16-year-old. Yeah. And so he marries her, but what we find out too is that his wife, who had died, didn't wasn't exactly dead when the kids showed up. <laughs> she was in the hospital in, in a attic. vegetative in a vegetative state <laughs> yeah. because yeah. of her botched suicide attempt. This is amazing. So add suicide to just the list of hor- horribly yeah, we'll, like. We'll go back and add a little errata <laughs> to our um, outro warnings on this episode. Bad things, and so. Um, then, as we're moving forward, Carrie, you think, oh, things might actually work out with her because she meets this minister who's very sweet. He loves her sweet singing voice. You think things... Yeah, he's still th- twice her age, I assume. And he's age-appropriate. And I think uh-huh. I think that they're... Um, I think that she's going to find love. Well, she... Meanwhile, she had been trying to communicate with the mother, Corinne, and had been rejected. And she's obviously has a lot of trauma and PTSD and whatever from everything that happened and losing her twin. Well, Carrie also commits suicide. Jesus Christ. And she does it by eating an arsenic lace oh, donut. Stop it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I love it. I don't want to say I love it for suicide, but I love that kind of like, <laughs> like that spite donut. I love a spite suicide. I, I love, I will yeah, admit it. I mean, a spite suicide. A literary spite suicide. And like, you know. Do I'm not like, commit a spite suicide. Yeah. But please don't eat the arsenic lace donuts. But you imaginary that. people, please do. Yeah. So the best thing about this book is Carrie is just hell bent on revenge. She is hell bent and unstoppable. So she's like, I've had enough of this shit. I'm glad somebody has. So she goes back up to Virginia to Foxworth Hall and she starts plotting. She, first of all, she finds Bart Winslow, her stepfather. <laughs> yes. And she hires him to settle some estate of mm-hmm. affairs, whatever. It's BS. She basically seduces him. <laughs> And starts having sex with her stepfather. But they're not related, so you're kind of like, oh, no, at least they're not related. It's not <laughs> so bad, because, you know, it's not, know, the bar not. has been lowered. Lowered, right. <laughs> and so she gets pregnant with Bart's child. And um, she hatches this plan where <laughs> she is going to unveil herself and out her mother at the annual Foxworth Hall Christmas so the, it's, wait, wait, it's like Reva Shane. Yes. It's like Reva Shane. Yes. And God and like, like basically getting in the fountain and being like, I'm the Horus Ring. Yes. She, 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 <laughs> Kathy, Kathy Dollinganger, did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, who knows? Whatever. She was like, she was married She's twice. She's Reva Shane. Time. Yes. She definitely has some Reva Shane quality. Oh my God. For those who don't know, Reva Shane is the ultimate soap opera heroine on Guiding Light. It was the best soap opera ever made. Continue. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, that's another thing. One of the first things K- Courtney and I ever bonded about was Reva Shane. And oh, my God. Reva Shane is the goddess. She's goddess. Like, that's all I want to be. So, is- I, 
So, oh, so I watched like a little bit of Young and the Restless in high school. When like to get away from like lunch, but I never really did that. No, Rita Shane time. was. Guiding Light was important to me. Like, my grandmother would, when I would stay with her, we'd go to McDonald's, and this is back when you just get a hamburger. Like, that was the thing was, like, you just got a hamburger and not crazy stuff. We'd get our little hamburgers, and we'd come back, and we'd watch Guiding Light. And, like, Reva Shane was always doing something with Joshua. Because I knew Joshua. 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 Like, <laughs> I think we were in Days of Our Lives. But I think Days of Our Lives was, like, cool before. Yeah. Like, when Marlena got possessed by the devil. I remember when Marlena got, got possessed by the devil because my friend got me into um, Days of Our Lives. But, see, Days of Our Lives came on at 1 and kind of, like, came on at 3. three. So, so it was you, perfect. You were home like, by school. You were, yeah. you were getting off the school bus, and your mom was watching it. I yeah. think there's definitely some, like, when we do this Dark Shadows book, to, to be discussed about, like, uh, yeah, because yeah, that, that's definitely the same experience oh my God. I had with Dark Shadows back in the day. Anyway, I'm sorry. Okay, oh, so she's okay. going to, yeah. like, she's going to Reva Shane it. She's yeah, going re- to do it. And she does, she plots it to a T, because, you know, her and Christopher were hiding in the cupboard all those yeah. years Oh, we do ago. remember this, yes. At that, at that unveiling party, her coming out party, yeah. and she was like, I'm back at Foxworth Hall. And I have to Totally not. And I don't have any my children. uncle. Yeah. And I didn't do that thing. Yeah. And I certainly don't have any children. Yeah. <laughs> so, Especially not four of like, kids. I mean, I get that you're going to have, like, one incest baby, but, like, when you get to the fourth one, you think that maybe it's on purpose. Well, remember, like, and, yeah, like, but looking back on it, they were all stressed that the twins were going to be weird. Yeah. And Which I didn't is, really, like... It, I mean, it wasn't even, like, they weren't even, like, a full <laughs> uncle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, yeah, seriously, we're not, like, which Charles oh, was it, oh. which, I have some things to reveal. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, go onward, onward and upward. But she had studied her mother so well that she copied the dress, the hairstyle, <laughs> the makeup. She basically wanted to show up as a doppelganger, gothic horror theme, by the way. A dollenganger. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I might actually have to read this shit. <laughs> <laughs> so she shows up. It, it was almost like V.C. Andrews had a checklist of all things gothic and was like, mm. yep, check. Oh, yeah. Got that check. Like in Rebecca where like she, <laughs> she wears the same like, Halloween costume. as Re- but, but she was like tricked into that by Mrs. Dan. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, we should read Rebecca. That'd be fun. That would be a good one. <laughs> so, so she shows up and all hell breaks loose because she reveals everything. Well. Yes. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy for me because it's been a while since I've read Petals on the Wind. But oh, this is all one book. Yeah, the mom goes. The mom goes crazy and loses it. It's the most important of the sequels to me. I mean, that's why I'm giving you that because yeah. this is where the revenge plot. This is where you. Oh, really... that, that's the cover of the book that I remember seeing around a lot. Like you know, I think maybe people lost interest after that one a lot. Yeah, yeah and and there's good reason for that. Um, <laughs> and so the mother like loses her mind, loses her shit, and goes crazy, and. I can't remember if it's the mother, Corinne, who sets Foxworth Hall on fire, or if it's Kathy. <laughs> I was waiting for that, that house some, to burn down. Some, it somebody had to burn, somebody like. can correct me on this. I'm sure some of the people who are listening know this, and they're just like, oh, that dumb bitch needs to know her shit better. But <laughs> <laughs> Don't come to V.C. Andrews party <laughs> unprepared. Oh, well, well wait till we do this Dark Shadows, but oh, we're going to get added. Yeah. This series horrified me so much, and I had so many bad dreams that I didn't want to go back and really reread all the books. Right. But I do remember that Foxworth Hall burned, burned. And um, the grandmother died. In the Bart, fire? Yes. The grandmother dies in the fire. So, Bart Winslow dies in the fire. So, I, she, okay. Now, let me stop you right here. Because when they left in the end of the flowers in the attic, they left a note thinking, like, oh, somebody's eventually going to, like, oh, this is a joke. Somebody's eventually going to see, you know, that we were here for four years. Oh, uh, yeah. Kathy writes, happen? like, the chalk thing. Kathy writes that chalk. Did anybody then... ever find it? Did it ever come out publicly? That's my, I don't think so. That's my, fa- and that was my favorite line of the book. We lived in the attic. Christopher, Corey, Carrie, and me. Now there are only three. See, I remember that, B.C. Andrews people. <laughs> All right. So, um, I, I want to say in that, like, climax of the burning of Foxworth Hall, Carrie or the mother, one, goes into the attic, and there's some reference to those mm-hmm. flowers. There's some reference to that. I don't okay. know. I don't know if Kathy went up there for inspiration before she did her <laughs> thing, but I do remember at some point, 
the attic is revisited. She would have had to. She had to go back in that attic. Like, get no pumped up. Like, didn't. get psyched like, yeah. up. Get yeah. pumped up. Because yeah. she definitely, like, thrived on the Because I guess it doesn't really matter in this book if the public found out. Because the public isn't mad. I mean, the only people that matter are these intensely inverted. It's like an ingrown toenail are these it's, people. Yeah. Like, very you know? true. Very yeah. true. And you wonder who these people are coming to this party. <laughs> You know, <laughs> <laughs> they're like the minister and his wife, and like the people who live down the road, and like they come oh like every year. This would be the greatest party, like this, because I could just imagine I'd be like, oh, the whole time I make and that like, noise by excited, like oh, oh, like what oh. if you were in the bathroom and you missed it? Like oh, be, people so... would tell you the whole rest of the year, like oh yeah, she is the one who missed. The- <laughs> because yeah, my mother has this enormous Christmas party every year, and yeah. it used to be a dinner party, as in, like, I would help cook, and we would feed a sit-down dinner to 40 people. We'd invite 30, 40 would come. We'd have, uh, 60, 40 would come. Just 40 people, no matter what. We'd have, like, just tables laid out, and on, she had it as... She they moved into a um a, you know an old folks home now so she got rid of some of the china she had enough china to feed forty people on her Christmas fucking china <laughs> okay yes so the next time so she has this party can like, like, in, like can we do this can like we reenact pedals in the wind at your mom's and she would be like. <laughs> Sarah Jean. <laughs> Sometimes I, what would she say? You're strange. <laughs> what she would say. And I know she doesn't listen because I haven't put it on her. Phone. No, I'm like forbade my father to listen to it. Like, but not, if we're going to do it, we'll do it at my mom's yeah. party because it's now a drop in. Yeah. So it's a little less, you can wear jeans now. Like before it said, um, oh, festive festive attire or something yeah. which you were supposed to just know meant no jeans and I don't know how you were you got a personalized invitation it was, it was a thing but yeah so now it's a drop in so it would be a little less um, exciting <laughs> if you were to show up in, <laughs> and you would be showing up in some 80s like holiday sweater if you no were, like, no <laughs> I'm showing up in a full like Reva Shane dress with like <laughs> with like a like a fur you're gonna fur jump fur. in that fountain I'm gonna jump in that fountain <laughs> <laughs> Wash, what was it? She yelled at Joshua. I hereby baptize myself the slut of Springfield. And Joshua was in the wheelchair and just watching her all non plus. Oh my God. There is a fountain out of the front of Still Hope. See, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. I'm There's ready a to like, the it up. I mean, it's got turtles in it. <laughs> Reva Shane, turtles aren't stopping her. Okay, all right. So, they die, so, so, the, so the grandmother and Bart Winslow die. And I think Christopher shows up because he's he's against Ka- he's like Kathy, you just need to let this go. They, our mother is. Oh, he's always been too willing to forgive. Hey, goody, goody, goody. I'm not. A, I'm him. not the biggest fan of Christopher. I mean, he's the least abusive person. Evidently, this woman I've ever had sex with, I and he's still a rapist. This is the thing. How, why does he get to be the doctor? He's the least critical of them all. <laughs> Kathy is the first to figure out all the shit. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. true. It's, I mean, well, I think that that's Vicky Andrews maybe saying like. Ugh, Dudes, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, like, you know, you got to ask a woman if you want to find out if your mother has decided to kill one of you or all of you. Quite he frankly. was hot, though. Yeah. Now, you I'm know a, how I feel about a blonde man? I know how you feel about a blonde man, but I, I enjoy a blonde there man. For that. I enjoy a blonde man. Yeah. And he was like, he just sounded golden. Unless he's a golden retriever. He sounded like okay. young, like a young Nick Nolte or like a young John Voight, which. And look what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> I said young. I'm not. He's obviously not on drugs, like yet. Or it ain't, it ain't affecting him yet. <laughs> he's but, not arsenic. He's like. Yeah. I mean, there was blood drinking in the attic. That yeah. is true. Yeah. Didn't he like put a belt around his arm? Yes, yes. He's feeding, feeding them blood. Like, come on. He's feeding them babies, though. I mean, that is very maternal. Mm-hmm. It is. He's very. Um, I'm again, my daughter. Like, I don't know if you breastfed because yeah. it's kind of like that. <laughs> I did. I did a mix of of, of both. And yeah, because what I had to do pumping in the bed. I can try. You know. Yeah. Seriously, you are giving a certain amount of blood. <laughs> you no, know, I like him. The dog is snoring. It's not the children in the attic of my house. So. <laughs> There's two dogs snoring. Actually. Yeah. yeah. So oh, the, God, they're both going. The one so, is, like, running. Okay, all right. So the so Kathy and Christopher decide, okay, you know, we're just going to do this thing. We're going to be man and wife and just go and get get on and leave. And that's the end. But one thing, one detail I forgot. When Kathy's getting, before Kat, before this big climax where Kathy gets the revenge on the mother, Kathy shows up to whip the grandmother. <laughs> 
Yes! Oh, yeah. I'm like, I'm gonna just go ahead. Cuddles in the Wind it's sounds coming. amazing. Who is like this old, decrepit woman <laughs> just with do... no hair. Yeah. Like, she didn't have no hair in the first yeah. round. No. Like this yeah. skeleton of a woman in the bed, and Kylie's like, Yeah, I'm here to beat your ass. <laughs> This is the greatest thing. No, so, granted, okay, so uh, what was your feeling on this? Because when we read Flowers in the Attic, yes, the grandmother is obviously supposed to be, like, the immediate villain, but it was really the mother who was the bad guy. I mean, like, the grandmother is what the grandmother is, right? The grandmother like, was a pervert, wasn't she? <laughs> Straight up pervert. I mean, she was terrible, yeah. <laughs> but she was a I know what you're doing. She was, like, like and that's the thing, like, I think she wanted him to. Like, she yeah, was like, you could get him. I'm going to put you in this, like, him. this hot house situation. Like, yeah, and the kids were like, doing rooms. what? They're like, what? And it's like, Like, they oh. really don't even understand, like, yeah. what it is. Like, she kind Thanks of forces giving, them into, yeah. yeah. Thanks for explaining to us what incest is, mother and grandmother. Yeah. Thanks for locking us up and seeing what happens. But really, I feel like the true villain in the, in the first book was the mother, is that she is the one who, like, fed them to a monster. And the monster is just, like, a thing that exists. Like, you know, the grandmother yeah. is just... So, I mean, I get them being angry at the grandmother, but really, it's the mother who is yeah. the problem here. But, I mean, you know? I guess, like, Kathy's... Again, Kathy tag... The thing I like about Kathy is Kathy always tags you back. <laughs> like, when the mom slapped her, she slaps her mom. Oh, yeah. So, like, you know, grandma whipped her, so she's coming back, mm-hmm. like... She did. She came back for the grandmother, and I and I don't think the grandmother blamed her really. I mean, like, well, I guess this was always going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we learned things. I I, I should okay. fast forward. Yeah, okay. Um, mm-hmm. but I won't. I, I spent a little bit more time on petals in the wind because I really feel like that's the culmination of the immediacy of of flowers in the attic. Mm-hmm. You want to find out what happens to these kids. Yeah. You want to find yeah. out what happens to the mother in Foxworth Hall. Then it gets a little. Weird after that. I'm not. Oh, as, it gets weird. I'm not as into the next books. Although the the final book, we'll get to that one. Okay. If there be thorns, the setting is 1982, and it's narrated by Kathy's sons, Jory and Bart. Oh, she names the baby Bart. What? After Bart. Yeah. After Bart, the her stepdad. Yeah. Because she's she has fond feelings for him. She she grows. Well, I guess have, it wasn't his fault. I mean, he, didn't, he didn't know that there so was So she's married children. to Christopher. She has two kids. Yes, she's married to Christopher. Are any Chris, like, they're not Christopher's no. kids. Okay. She has, she has her son from Julian the Ballet Dancer and her son from Bart. They're both like these, you know, dark haired guys. They're there you not, go. They're not. <laughs> they're not a dark haired right, they're, they're, they're not blondes. Okay. So Bart is a shithead. He's jealous of his brother, okay? <laughs> his brother is like this... I love hating kids. His, his brother is like this ballet dancer who's very good-looking and very graceful, and Bart doesn't feel graceful. Because his name's Bart. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Kathy has her ballet career. They're, her and Christopher are living as cus- husband and wife, and they adopt Cindy, a two-year-old girl. Oh, no, they're seen in. This is not good. So they adopt Cindy and bring her in. And, of course, Bart is resentful and plots against her, too. I think maybe he tries to drown her or something. Jesus, Bart. But Bart befriends this creepy elderly neighbor woman who encourages oh, I about him. about this. Okay, I remember this on Wikipedia. Encourages him to call her Corinne. How, how do people Guess, not see who their oh, neighbors are? This is, Guess what? But like, dude, why does Kathy not? Like, hey, that neighbor looks like my mama. <laughs> I think she kind of hides herself. This is but, but yeah, amazing. It is Corian. So, and it's not, it's Corian and John Amos, who was the butler at the original right. Fox. Right, yeah, the one like, that had long yeah. sex, and Chris didn't like the scene. So it was like, probably like two and, like, and a half minutes. He's like, this sex is taking too long. And I was like, Jesus, <laughs> poor Kathy. <laughs> so, so they're living next door, and Corian has managed to get out of the mental institution from her breakdown, and she is living next door and creeping on on Kathy and Christopher. And, of course, John Amos is filling Bart's head with all kinds of misogynistic BS and crazy stuff about God's punishment uh, to the point where he turns him against well, his Well, honestly, parents. these book dudes, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> terrible enough things happen to these people that in this world. Maybe there is a vengeful God who hates him. It's bananas. Yeah. Okay, all right. So Kathy, it, it is like that. Kathy has an accident and ends up in a wheelchair. Of course. And starts writing her life story. Bart <laughs> learns the truth about Kathy and Christopher and uh, and about the grandmother. 
and he starts calling them Devil Spawn. Oh, Jesus, and Devil would, Spawn. Now, if I were Kathy or Christopher, I'd be like, I'm not having any of yeah, this shit yeah. from you, little kid. Hey, I'm going to beat you and put you in an attic if you <laughs> think you <laughs> like, like, do you, are you underestimating me? Yeah. You <laughs> don't get to call me Devil Spawn, yeah. okay? You I call you Devil Spawn. You have to go <laughs> <laughs> and I point out that we are drinking um, the sinful grin Petit yes. Syrah. <laughs> so Jor- Jory, being the the, the, sweet one. the sweet one that he is, he finds out and he confronts them and was like, "Is this true?" And they're like, "Yes, it's true." And he's like, "I forgive you." And Bart's not doing it. So um, Kathy does find out that her mother is next door, and guess what she does. She attacks her! Yeah! <laughs> in the wheelchair? Like, she just rams her? Or, like... Um... It doesn't matter. Burn your house down. Please say burn your house down. Well, they're in apartments, so you can't burn the apartment. I don't know if it's a verbal attack. I can't remember. It's been a yeah. long time. But... <laughs> anyway, Kathy's coming out swinging. She's not going She's to She's rolling. Her. She's... <laughs> you can't see me, like, mining. I love it. If I, love I were, it. like, yeah, to get somebody in my wheelchair, but... <laughs> I liked your mom. I mean, I like, <laughs> I'm sure the people in wheelchairs will appreciate your miming. <laughs> well, John anyway, Amos okay. decides to lock them up. Who's he lock up? Kathy Corn and Corn and Linda? Kathy together. Oh, oh Lord, that's shit. That's a terrible idea. But the house catches fire. Of course it does. <laughs> and Corin saves Kathy, but dies. She has oh. one last one last act to try to, I uh, guess, bullshit. absolve herself. No, oh, I wanted, like, Kathy to throw her in the fire. But John Amos dies. Good. Because <laughs> that's what Missy Andrews does with characters she doesn't know what to do with anymore. Just kill she just gets rid of them. Just kill them. <laughs> and the whole thing, I really, I can't remember where in the timeline that Kathy has an accident and ends up in the wheelchair. But I'm pretty sure it's in that book. But the next book, Seeds of Yesterday. There's so many books. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy is 52, and that book was set in the future, like 97-ish, yeah. early 2000s. Bart decides to build the replica of Foxworth Hall at this point. <laughs> Where's he got this money? Well, because guess, he's a weirdo. and uh, Yeah, that's that's a good maybe question. Maybe Corinne because left it to him. Well, no, she would have inherited, right? Because Corinne didn't inherit if she had any kids, and eventually, I guess, it fucking came out. And then, like, so none of these people actually inherited all this damn fortune. I guess it went to the cats. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I think know. I think Corinne did get it because her and Bart yeah. were because she had Foxworth Hall renovated because they made it clear that she did not get the money if she had children either from a previous if she ever had children. Like it was really clear. I don't know. But yeah. her grandfather but maybe. I mean, may, I don't know how the law works in Virginia, but maybe that was an illegal part of the will. It would be. It would be an interesting thing to go back and check on because she, I know she did inherit it. And I'm wondering what happened after she was found to have children because it. Well, it if we know that Corinne is shady as hell, like so, Corinne is going to be shady. You can contest a will, you know. I mean, yeah. like you know, you can. So that's why I've always been told that you should do that, like old gothic thing. Like you don't say I am disinheriting my sister because she fucked my husband. Because then she can maybe go and say, I didn't fuck her husband. I was opposed to, I should say, because of reasons that are known to her. It, it very well could have ended up, if it ended up in, in testacy, it very well could have ended up with the children. Um, maybe that will just never be found. <laughs> because, you know. It, I love that we're good, making this like a law and order yeah, thing. Like. But this is a good question that I didn't even think about those details when I was going back and reviewing it. Because I was just like reliving the horror of it, kind of. <laughs> But yes, that's that's okay. So he's building true. a replica with. We don't know where the money came from, but he's got money enough to build yes. Foxworth Hall. Yeah, there's, oh. there's these people always like money. to slip and land into money somehow. Oh my god, because they're good looking, and this thing believes that like good looking people just you know. Well, they're so beautiful. It, well, I mean that's soap operas, right? The, right. the good looking people have money. They don't. You never see them. With or money. they start off poor, but then get money. Yeah. Like Reva Shame. Oh, they'll be who grew years. up in Oklahoma. Well, like they'll be like, and then moved to downstairs. Springfield. But well, didn't HB have money? Come on, HB well, she, wasn't a pauper. <laughs> Was she was, I feel like she wasn't first part that of that. That was the, her daddy, right? Well, HB was her daddy, but I feel like at first he wasn't a lot of money, and then he got into oil. I think. Then he got into oil. <laughs> Well, they yeah. all get money somehow. But I'm, like, I'm gonna. You bring, never really see them I'm get gonna the money, find though. a way to bring up Reva Shane as much the as I can. The money is always this vague. Like the money just the money. happens. Like wills are real. Like because you'll see a will being read out like it's not actually read out in real life in every goddamn soap opera. Because we're all sitting there and we all hear the will at the same time and then we get in a fight. Yeah, because right? Reva Shane gets cut out of the will, but she's 
She's gonna fight but it. But that doesn't happen. You don't actually get people in a room and read the will. I mean, that's not a thing that is in real life. But well, it's I very mean, dramatic. Anyway, okay, anyway, we're, we're, okay, so Foxworth Bart, Hall. Bart builds the Foxworth Hall, and then Uncle Joe comes back, and he like, is. Like, does he furnish it? Like, who the fuck the is Uncle Joe? Attic, like, the actual attic stuff? Like, is it like a dollhouse, or what? No, who, it's a real. Who's Uncle no, Joe? No, but I mean, like, do they, like, put, like, trunks, and I mean, is it like a <coughs> new house, or is it like. I'm not sure. I have questions. I'm not sure if he, how he. If he furnishes it exactly the way it was, or like the swan bed, no, that was yeah, always a big thing. The, the swan, swan bed, yeah, the swan bed makes a reappearance, <laughs> and not I don't know. And that, Kathy fucks somebody that she's related to. On <laughs> anyway, you. but um, Uncle Joe is Corin's brother, who is believed to have been killed in oh, an avalanche. Oh, avalanche, what? dead brother, and he he he's had been living in this monastery all this time and of course he he <laughs> comes is, back I'll... he comes back and becomes head butler and of course he's misogynistic and all about god's punishment right why because any man who grows up in this terrible like nasty ass hot house ends up fucked up whereas the women they can go whatever kind of way he's a bad influence on bart who's already on a bad road um jory the the good son he comes in with his pregnant wife, Melody, and they move in. And, of course, Bart's jealous of them, too. Why would you move in? <clears throat> because Jory's stupid. He's it's like Chris. Why yeah, any of these fucking house? He sees the, every, the good in everybody. I'm just saying real estate's expensive. Rent is expensive. It's a real big house. Did you really have to actually ever run into these people? That's true. Just saying. Why yeah. any of you these... You can live in the attic and nobody know about it. Evidently. That's true. Why any of these people agree to live in a replica of Foxworth Hall, the the how, the manner of horrors <laughs> yeah. is beyond me. Why Kathy and Chris, why they're even indulging Bart is beyond me. Um, and that's and that's why I was, I was started to... I was really disconnected. After Petals in the Wind, I was really disconnecting because right. I just wasn't having Bart's character. Because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, Kathy's such a badass, and then she just lets her son... Do whatever. Well, do you think that part of it is, though... Like, So when you read, and you're a teenager, you read Letters in the Attic, and it's about teenagers and going through their teenage stuff. And you read Petals in the Wind, and most of the books you read when you're a teenager are about people in their 20s. Right, and you feel like Seventeen magazine is read by thirteen-year-olds. I mean, yeah. like you know, th- yeah. that's the thing that, that the kids that age are interested in. After a certain age, do you think that maybe you just lose interest because a person's problems after age thirty are not interesting to a teenager, or that might have been part of it, or just that after Petals of the Wind, you felt like you got it out of you? I kind of felt like I got it out of me. I felt like Petals of the in the Wind was a good stopping mm-hmm. point for me. However. I was so invested mm-hmm. that I was going to see this thing through. No, I, right. I had to read the rest of this series. And also, I know that uh, frequently, it would really bother me, especially when I was younger, I would read a book and I'd be really invested in the, in the viewpoint characters. And then in the next book, it would be a different viewpoint character. It would be like a son or a brother or whatever. And I'd be like, fuck this shit. I, I, I was here for... People A and B, and I was not here for right. Bart and whoever. I'm not, but yeah, I wasn't there yeah. for Bart and Jory, and so I was just reading through it like, yeah. okay, I got it. Because you just want to hear it. more about Kathy and Chris because you cared about them. Mm-hmm. You think that that was part of it? Yeah, absolutely. So Bart, he he creeps people out. He's creeping out Cindy. I think he's threatening her bows and and all this stuff. So she pieces out and leaves and goes to school. I think Smart. in New York. My God, maybe somebody made it out of here. Bart <laughs> builds a chapel and forces everyone to attend <laughs> church services. And <laughs> this is when do? this is when Chris and Kathy say they've had enough and they decide to leave, but Chris dies. No, dead Chris. No. Yeah. Chris dies in an accident. Why does everybody really, have an accident? This is why I his car catch on fire after he. I can't swerved. remember if he has a similar accident the way his dad I bet he did. must. I, I bet you any money he did. Accident. I bet you a thousand percent that the exact same things happened so, in his car. So yeah, some of the VC Andrews fanatics can probably correct me on some of these minor details, but he dies. Um, And Bart turns around, though, and gives this big moving eulogy, and he apologizes. So he sort of absolves himself. It's so weird. Um, But Kathy gets depressed, basically goes up into the attic of this replica Foxworth Hall and puts some paper flowers up and dies. That's how Kathy dies. What? And it's like... 
I guess she's killed all the people she can kill. And yeah. <laughs> After and, a while, you're going to feel like, oh, oh well. Oh, that's sad. And I don't want her to, like, I mean. Give a live, live a good life. Like, get over it and move forward and get some. Well, she, that's her blonde face to ask. Get so, over it like, and move forward. And I'm wondering, I think, she, I think she's actually in the wheelchair, has the accident before this book. Oh, but maybe, but maybe, but maybe, but maybe, how'd she get up the fucking maybe, attic? But maybe it's this book. Yeah, I, I, I have some questions. I because really, it's a very narrow stairway. It, it, assuming it is an exact replica, which how maybe even they would put it an be? elevator in. <laughs> well, to the attic. But here's the thing: if she lives in that house, then yeah, he's gonna put an elevator in. Oh well, places. yeah, 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 true. So. But up to the attic. I am just saying that, like, uh, oh, I want, oh, we haven't finished the uh, elevator to the attic. Oh, what about now? Oh, yeah, there's a problem with the materials. <laughs> what about now? Oh, yeah, the workman didn't show up. Like, uh, maybe it's not a great idea for you to go oh, back up to the attic. Like, so I'm fuzzy on that detail and would like, that's that's a question that I But have. I feel like it's if she lives she in that house, that. too, then he's probably put in, like, yeah. But ADA she, accessible. So it's sort of alluded to that she dies of a broken heart because Christopher's gone. Um... He's her love. Right. Her brother love. She's out of people to murder. So, Like, exactly. you can only murder so many people, and then, like, your heart is broken because you want to do some more murdering, and then it's just, you know. Well, I mean, she only really murdered, like, she only arsoned Bart Sr. and <laughs> the grandma. So, it's like. Well, that's not really very satisfying, is it? No, I mean, I'm just saying she didn't murder hard. It's not like she murdered a well, lot of but people. And I'm still not she died. We don't I'm, know who I'm started not, the fire. I'm, still, I'm still not clear Corinne. if it was her or her mother who started it. I mean, Corinne, the fire. 10 to 1, started that fucking fire. Um, well, I anyway. don't know. Right, is there another book happy. or is it? Yeah, there's another book. Why don't oh, and, and, Why is there this, another book with the two characters that, like, you care about? We're done now. Because. It's, oh. a, it's a prequel. <gasps> oh, oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, because I was, at this point, I was like, okay, Kathy and Christopher are dead. I can't take any more of this Bart shit. Did I you will. learn anything about the future in this? Because it was the future, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you learn anything? <laughs> yes, Sarah. Like, you know, <laughs> like, like where they're flying. Like, Dark Shadows does this, too, which I think is hilarious. Like, like, uh, like they went to the, also, like, 1997, which is a lot farther for them. You thought like, it was, like, a Blade Runner situation? <laughs> where, like, <maybe. laughs> we thought that 20, whatever, 19, what, if, what if, oh God, all the Blade Runner people are going to at me. And you know what? Come at me, because... I, I think Blade Runner's boring. Hey, oh, I said it. You can't oh. be. You can't be an expert in everything. There is gonna be a rift. <laughs> There's it's gonna fine. be a. It's fine. But like, what what, what year was Blade Runner? Oh. It was like 2018 or 2017, right? Or 2019? Yeah, something like that. But like, the future looks amazing. Don't at me. No, it doesn't. It looks like a crap sack future. Well, I mean, it was like all sex Income robots. Income inequality and stuff. is like. Why would you think I would like Blade Runner? You know how I feel about robots. But there's, and there's no a space. Shit, there's I a shit ton of elsewhere. robots. But didn't you watch? Do you watch Small Wonder? Didn't you? Oh my With god! Vicky? Yeah, I watched Small Wonder, I, and like, fuck that! Like, when she's all like, wasn't that creepy? Oh, what was the other one? The Electric Grandma or something? The, oh, the, the, oh, the, 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 the Ray Bradbury thing. And she like she rocked really fast to like oh. charge herself. Somebody you know what was I'm trying about? to like, own that at the library, and we can't get it because like it's just like it's not on print. You can't get it. Yeah, like it was like the Electric Grandma. Or I something. was thinking of the That's Twilight Zone episode where they bring the grandma. In. It's probably it like based, based on that. Yeah. That's a Ray Bradbury story, the electric grandma. Yeah. But see, like I had in second grade, you know those horrible Halloween costumes? The ones yeah. with the mask and all? Oh. I, I was busy <laughs> some small creepy. wonder. <laughs> yeah, and you know how your mouth feels against that slit? Oh god, the slits. Yeah. I think we were both like, we were always care, like I was always a care bear, so I know you were always a care bear or like strawberry shortcake. Those were mine. No, my well, little ponies? Because I was that one year too. As soon as I could get my hands on, on, on Halloween makeup, I was done with all that plastic shit. I was painting my face up all crazy. The hilarious things. thing is that my mother made me loving handmade costumes for years, and then I said, no. I want no, those cheap plastic I want ones, some store bought yeah. bullshit. <laughs> oh my God. She <laughs> sewed them. With love, love in every scene, yeah. and I was like, "Fuck you!" So this is actually going to happen <laughs> next year <laughs> because I have made Howling Goshens for my son all this time. Vicky he was Frodo. Right? Yeah, he was adorable. That he was Bam Bam. He was so cute. This last year, he was now speed he's going to want to be. He's going to want to be Batman with no, like the PJ masks, dude. It's going to be PJ masks. Oh my god. Okay. 
All right, so, so prequel, sorry. prequel. So, so yes, <laughs> because we couldn't take any more of the Bart shit, right? Yeah, Bart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, did he live through all that? I, I, I didn't follow his thread. Did he? Is he safe and sound think, and happy? And I think. Shit? I think he does live. I oh, think. I think he he realizes he had to come up like he did the epiphany eulogy where he's mm-hmm. like forgave and no, like, he don't. He don't mm. But I'm, Guardian of Shadows and some some information that people need to know. V.C. Andrews died of breast yeah. cancer in 1986. But she's like the Tupac of authors. Yeah. Right. Her estate hired a ghostwriter, a man. Yeah. And this is the man And the who, thing is, you can tell through all this that a woman is writing yeah. this. I mean, this is a very female yeah. fevered fantasy. And so, you know. and so this is the same. He has written like over 40 books in his own name and like... More than that under V.C. Andrews. I think they're probably still publishing stuff under oh, her Oh, probably. I, I, I meant to look It's a franchise. Yeah. yeah. Taxable by the IRS. I learned by reading oh, yeah. all of these I love, things. Like, I wish y'all could see. I'm going to have to take it. Like, there are notes. Sarah came prepared. Like, Oh, my God. She's got this beautiful thing spread out, and her yeah. handwriting is exquisite. You can tell she is, like, researched. Too. Like, we're going to have to take a picture of this and put it on Instagram but, for y'all. But this is the thing. It's not until we start talking and I realize some of the details I don't remember. Like, I don't remember as much about the wheelchair as I feel like I Dude, should. Dude, you remember so much. It's been like, and why don't I remember who started the fire? I think I was so hyped up on the fact that she oh, showed yeah. up and had that ring Oh, I'm moment. sure. You were so, like, just, just, on. You were just, going. <laughs> just the fact that the place burned down was enough for me. But what I find interesting is that you were upset Right by mm. your by your reengaging with this material, right? Mm. Oh, yeah. You want to tell our listeners a little bit about that? Oh yeah. So when I was invited to come back, and I started thinking about the books again, and really, you know, getting my thoughts together um, for this podcast, I started having nightmares, and I've had a couple of nights of nightmares, specifically about flowers in the attic, because out of all the books in this series, that book is is the best and it is the in my opinion the most gothic horror of the genre the rest of them are just continuing the story um and it's just some of the imagery despite whether or not you think the writing is that good or not the imagery and her vc andrew's ability to develop a character was good, I think. I agree, yeah. And I think that it was enough to hook you. And just the the thought, when you're coming of age, when you're about the same age as Kathy, to read about children who are put into an attic and they're forced to go through puberty in an attic and they're forced to lose a sibling in the attic and they're tortured, beaten, and in Kathy's case, she's raped, um, starved. I mean... You you may be reading it with a straight face, because I was also reading Stephen King at that time. Yeah, and that's, it's funny that you weren't even here when we were yeah, talking about Yeah, we were talking about, about like, for us, like, for me, yeah. one of the things I brought up about this, and, like, it's a thing that, obviously, now as an adult, like, it it's gross, but, like, you remember, okay, like, Stephen King's It was, like, a big thing, because, again, it's kids our age. So, like, the Bev scene... You thought you were grown. Like, the, yeah. you, like, the <laughs> Beverly scene that we now know is awful and all this stuff, like... As a kid? Like, and here's the thing, like, I'm, I don't condemn Stephen King for putting that in there, because, no. like... Well, he's never known how to end a book, for one thing. But <laughs> also, like, know. that sex scene, like, where she, like, basically has it sex with vital. everyone. Like, it, it was, was, like, super titillating, and, like, as a 12-year-old, I was like, well, fuck, now Bev's an adult, because she's doing this, like, very, like, it was, thing. It was legitimately vital. It was, yeah, like, giving like, the, the nasty blood of it, I so, guess. So, like, like, I feel know? like people who are, like, ah, Stephen King for writing it, it like... For being 12 years old, that was one of the scenes that, like, I still remember that entire, like, I remember that yes. passage, like, they got how, her, like, and, yeah, how yeah. sex with Bill was versus sex with Ben. And, and like, like, the fat guy, like, actually, yeah. I, and yeah. I like, even, like, get into it because, but, yeah. Yeah, like, it was really important <coughs> to me. Yeah, yeah And so, I feel like it's easy, like, as an adult in our thirties, like, you know, like to be like, <laughs> really? to We're look back 30s? with horror, like what yeah. the hell was I reading? What I'm kind sorry. of but at the same one of us is no longer in our thirties. Oh yeah. <laughs> what did I did I just say? No, that? not quite. 
Not not yet. Actually, I'm technically not 40 yet. Yeah, so I won't I'll, be 40 in, until the next weekend. Mm-hmm. Oh, is it? Okay. All right. So, so we're like, still in our 30s. Yeah, we're, like, we're, so, just, we're celebrating early. But, like, you know, like, we look at it and we <laughs> talk about the horror of it. But, mm-hmm. like, as a 12-year-old reading it, like, that shit was important. It's the excitement of it. And, and the, so, like, I can't condemn it because... Trying to tap into it, this... It got Something. people into the book who would have never otherwise have read it. Yeah. And the soap opera element of it got people into the horror element who would yeah. have never picked up a horror book. But your yeah. life, when you are that age, is like that. It is so intense. Yeah. And everything is either the worst thing or the best thing that has ever happened to you. And yeah. your mother won't let you go to this movie and it is like, oh, she's trapping me in it. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Teenagers are trapped, trapped right? It's, it, oh, I can't be on the phone past midnight. I'm so trapped. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like, that kind of <laughs> intensification of life is what it's actually like to be yeah. a teenager. And we cannot tap into that anymore more yeah so that's what i think is so great about having like you want to like because again you read this and like you read this when it was and we are literally older than anybody who responded to our survey had read it we yeah. are at least no, five nobody years older than read that. it like over the age of 35 like oh. there's one person that read it in their 30s and then like a few people who read it in their 20s but everybody else was under the age of 18 yeah. and i think that's really important and yes. most people like put like they were between 13 or like between 11 to 15 in like mm-hmm. their age range of reading like, honestly and not even late high school yeah so mm-hmm. that's what i'm saying like you right. see people in middle school and then like your freshman year of high school yeah. walking around with this book right mm-hmm. so okay oh so bre- yeah the, oh, no, the, the, prequel. the prequel so this reads like a twisted genealogy of incest okay mm-hmm. you see where it all comes from it's been in the family for a while oh, okay you, know, you should keep it in the family but ah, so so there. so yeah. the reason I brought up the whole thing with V.C. Andrews and the Ghost Rider is that it's not clear how much of this book V.C. Andrews actually wrote. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, yeah, because okay. she didn't write her, it. Her Ghost Rider might have actually written. Um, I think Andrew Niederman. Yeah. I think he may have written. What some a, of, a like then you got a V.C. Andrews to. Andrew Niederman, and they had the yeah, same like literary a, agent. That's how. So yeah. V.C. Andrews was really sick. And they shared the same literary agent, and uh, the literary agent, I think, approached Niederman and, and asked him if he might be interested in that sort of thing. But the ghostwriter enter, enters the picture and writes at least some, or possibly all, of this book. It's not sure. We're not sure. Right. But this is the story of the grandmother. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord. Which is what I want to know, right? And, yeah. and so it's but, set from about, like, 19... 19- 18-ish to 1957. But often you don't want to know, really. You think you want to know, like, Hannibal. Mm-hmm. Like, you think you want to know Hannibal. Then yeah. you don't. You just like a little, like, a little salt of Hannibal. You don't want a whole roast of Hannibal. So she's, she's, a, she's a sober and an intelligent woman, right? And mm-hmm. Malcolm, who has all this money, likes that about her. He likes, he sees her as somebody who can run his estate, right? Right. So he, I think she's maybe in Connecticut or something. He brings her to Virginia. And he pretty much immediately starts to flirt with other women because he turns out to be a big horn dog and ignores her. He becomes a jerk. Because the grandfather is barely a character in the book. Right? Yeah. Like, he's just, like, things you hear things about. I wasn't sure Malcolm. he was actually existed until yeah. so we learn We learn a lot about Malcolm Foxworth, and he is an asshole. He, oh, uh, he, had, been, he, he had been abandoned by his mother. And her name was Corinne. Oh, God. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. So you got this uh, theme of mother abandonment again. And we're in, we, we learned oh, that this... Oh, let's point out something that I did not know, realize until you told me downstairs. That Flowers in the Attic is dedicated to... V.C. Andrews' mother. Yeah, I'm just I'm just saying. I'm not saying anything about any of these people. I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> and I'm saying that if I had dedicated a book about being abused by my mother to my mother, she would have words for me. Yeah, and from what I've read, and I have no idea because V.C. Andrews' private life was very elusive and very... I think she only gave a couple of interviews. One to People Magazine and another to um, some... Um, Genre, horror genre publication that I can't remember off the top of my head. How, how, let me let me just jump in. I'm lo- I'm on like there's like a VC Andrew wiki. So of course there is banana shit. That okay. So Corinne's the one who starts the fire, but you know how they told everybody that they took Corey to the hospital. Oh yeah, they oh, didn't. Oh, he's I think or they didn't. No, but he's still in the house. What? They don't. Li- he doesn't leave the house. They keep him in the house, and the house is so big that nobody smells him oh. decomposing. Oh my god! 
So, okay. I had forgotten that detail. Sorry. Sorry. I did not believe that. That's an important detail. That's because the thing is, they keep bringing a child. Who suddenly dies in pneumonia? They autopsy him. Yeah, like, no, that's, that's, no, that's actual like, real life. I mean, you know. Yeah, but no, they 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 lie and say they took him to the hospital. I, I mean, oh, I, I didn't think, believe that for a minute. Well, I knew they didn't take him to the hospital, but like I thought they would like fucking just bury him outside. So in other words, if there's parts of the hospital of this house where you would not smell, then these kids could have been roaming and they could have had another room for the boys. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. okay so right. that's okay. So he's got these mother abandonment issues. And um, so we hear about the swan bed. So there's a, the swan bed goes way back, apparently. And yes. it's, it's kind of a, a shrine to his mother because that's not creepy at all, right? No. no. Um, so the grandmother, Olivia, and Malcolm, their consummation of their marriage is more like an attack. It's not some gratuitous sex. Like all sexes in this book. Like when like, it's like very all, like they, brutal. So, BC Andrews, you can tell us. All right, you can you can you can you can say like, it to us. And all we the won't sex tell was anybody. attack. Like and when Chris and when Chris and Kathy have sex. Mm-hmm. Again, she says it's not rape that she wants it, but it like the way it's written and described is like well, an the attack. Fact that she has to say that it's an yeah, attack. Like, yeah. So we never know what consent looks like in any yeah, of these books. No, and that's uh, really upsetting to me that these girls were reading these books. Right, but it goes that uh, anyway. It, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll so that's a kind of our thesis as a podcast. Yeah, that so is during, our thesis. So, so during this sexual encounter, he's saying his mother's name. Oh, <gasps> so Malcolm's totally messed up, y'all. Um. So, Olivia has a couple of children, and they're boys, but Malcolm wants a daughter. So, he Um, can fuck her. Yeah, probably. And um, Malcolm's dad comes back to Foxworth Hall, but with a young bride. She's, like, not even 20. She's, like, 19. Oh, well, that's actually old for this book. Right. For this thing. Her name's Alicia, and she gives birth to Christopher Sr., Right. So, here we learn about Christopher Sr. Christopher Sr. is the the child of... of, um, Malcolm, Malcolm's, Malcolm Foxworth's dad, mm-hmm. and Alicia. So, he's just this great boy. Everybody loves him. He's this beautiful blonde boy. He's that golden. Lights he's the golden. light of they Foxworth. Love, they love that we're golden. And they? even Olivia loves him because at this point, Olivia hasn't turned into a total cruel, evil person yet. Right. And she loves Christopher Sr. And Malcolm sees this young, hot Alicia, and of course, he wants to seduce her. And he tries and tries and tries, and she doesn't fall for it. So guess what he does? Rapes her. He rapes her. Oh of course god! He does. Because that happens throughout this series, and um, yeah. So guess what happens? Alicia gets pregnant. So yeah. they're like full their brother yeah. and sister. Yeah. So it's like oh. Kathy and Chris. So, so wait, no, okay, well, draw me this family tree now because I've gotten okay. a little. <laughs> okay, All right. when I said. Twisted genealogy of incest. So Malcolm is not joking. the Malcolm's not the parent of either Chris Senior or or Corinne. Okay, it's wait, Malcolm's no. dad, right? Okay, so yeah. it is not. Oh wait, no, no. Wait, yeah. Malcolm's Malcolm is dad. The dad. Malcolm's dad is the the father it, of, of both of both Corinne and Christopher oh, Senior. Oh, so it's your brother, uncle, and and Alicia. No, wait. No, you're so, no, so sorry. Right, you right. were right. I'm sorry. No, I'm wait, no. Like so. Malcolm rapes Alicia. And Alicia gets pregnant with Corinne. So she is the daughter of Malcolm. But she's the half sister mm-hmm. of Christopher Sr. Right. In Fisher addition to him being her half uncle. So Alicia. in other words, it's not as distant as we thought it was. Right. Was to it's more of a Kathy Christopher situation. However, it does not still matter because they did not grow up together. I say that the, what makes incest is growing up with somebody. All right. Other than, obviously, genetic diseases and such. <laughs> so, 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 Alicia is the mother of both Corinne and Christopher Sr. Right. So, and then you have Malcolm and his dad, who were the respective well, dads. Well, I was really surprised right. when Flair's in the attic. That, like, even on the train, Corinne tells um, Chris and Kathy, oh, our name, uh, our names used to be this, but our names are now this. And, like, she's not, like, a, kind of, like, I get that. She lives in a time in a place where you always took your husband's name, but there's usually two involved. Yeah, no. and, and she just completely does not even notice that going by. Mm-mm. You know, and I get that she's like under trauma, but I noticed it going by. Mm-hmm. And then again, I was primed for incest. Yeah. Okay. So the grandmother 
when when she finds out that Alicia is pregnant, she's really mad. Okay, well, this is I when mean, the grandmother cracks. Obviously, so. but, um, but not necessarily at the girl. But that well, is what happens. She does because you've got again God's punishments coming in here to like yeah. burn everybody to he- in the hellfires of damnation, right? So the grandmother becomes very resent- resentful of pretty women because she thinks they're tempting the men, right? And she hates the men too. So the grandmother is a com- is probably one of the more complicated characters because she was abused right because like, that's why she won't go in the attic in the first book is it like cuz she was like stuck in a closet yeah i can't remember her the i can't remember the source of her um she was dreadfully claustrophobic. But she like, had an issue. She would not go through the closet you had to go to to get to the attic and the weird thing is this makes no sense to this kind of house is that that was the only way up to the attic Right. Yeah, that, that does no not sense. make any sense. <laughs> and so, because it's just an unassuming little room off the off the yeah. wing. Yeah, I, And the, this uh, is like the kind of house that's been added on to and added yeah. on to and added on to. And this is the kind of house where you have stuff in the attic that is like giant furniture. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, what, so they have to hatch a plan to hide, because this is scandal, right? Mm-hmm. So they have to hatch a plan to hide Alicia away while well, that's uh, she's all pregnant. Time. That is done all the time. So guess what they guess where Alicia hangs out? The attic. Of course. Uh, they had homes for those girls. But I guess like our kind well, of people didn't send them there. She's made. But yeah, she she hides Alicia during her pregnancy. Um, but it's it, but it's a thing where I think Alicia agrees to it. I I can't remember. I don't think she's being like held against her will in the sense. Well, of, that was very common. You know, I think she agreed. They would send you to. I mean, sometimes you get yeah. sent to the Magdalene Laundries and fuck you. But sometimes you would get sent to a place, and it was a good thing for you yeah. because it would save you. And and it's you know, interesting it that name, you know that you have these women in this situation, and instead of just. They're just saving the men's ass. It's a oh, scandal. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's yeah. let's clean this. The up. men never get hung. Let's no, clean this up for them. Laundry. Let's yeah. clean this up for them and war against each other. Yeah, you know. And so, so anyway, uh, after Alicia has the baby, it's given and presented as if it's Olivia's. Olivia feigns this pregnancy, and um, which has got to be ridiculous, by the way. Like, oh my goodness, that smells terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, when Alicia, after Alicia has the bait, has Corinne, she moves away and takes Chris Sr. with her. Right. Eventually, Alicia becomes ill. I think she has cancer. And she contacts them um, and begs them to take in Christopher Sr. Okay. So, this is how we get Christopher Sr. back, back at, in the house. Right, yeah. call. So, Christopher Sr. and Corinne are about the same age. Corinne's a little bit younger. and Yeah, he's 17 when he came back to the house and she was 14. But that's completely per yeah. course of these books. I mean, that's so, not, yeah. that's it's not like, unusual. It's, like, it's all like cyclical. Like, it's all yeah. this, yeah. So, they eventually, they eventually, you know, so get it actually on does in the swan sense. bed. They get it on in a swan bed. Is it, like, ah. at least not aggressive? Like, like it's, like, good doing I, it? I, yeah, I don't think, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I don't think. That's going to be our memoir, by the way. They get it on in the swan bed. They get it on in the swan I bed. think, yeah, I, I would have to go back, but I don't remember, I don't remember Christopher Sr. and Corinne having a, a rapey But then, yeah. cl- would you remember, though, because all these things that I read when I was that age, it was all like that. Yeah. And I didn't it really think it was like unusual, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, we all, like, everything that we read, like, and again, we'll talk about that, like, when we get to questions and stuff. But we were used to it. Yeah, it was not at all unusual. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's not unusual to be like, oh yeah, the women are going to hate each other, and they're going to clean up yeah. this mess yeah. for the men. Yeah, that's another thing. Well, that we uh, got, yeah, yeah, thank you for setting up why we had to do this Bechdel to bitch like question yeah. our thing because it turned out that all these books, if they're over a certain age, have yeah. a woman of a different hair color, a your different ass. hair color who is the arch nemesis. Yeah, so. like what up with that? So. Like there's like they're never on each other's side. They're mm-hmm. never like yeah. But it makes me wonder about VCS. Because I've not, okay, I've never read My Sweet Adrena. I haven't either. But my understanding is it's another woman who is essentially trapped in a house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There might even be a wheelchair, but I'm not sure. But she's, is she a clone? Or I, she's like a. Reva Shane was a clone! Reva Shane was a clone! What? <laughs> what? Been with that doppelganger double theme again. <laughs> what? No, no, no. Reva Shane. No. Yeah. Reva Shane got cloned. It was a whole. <laughs> 
Was I'm it, the Gaudi Light? That's like a grandma soap opera. Was it, was it the, um... Oh, my God. So, she gets cloned. Did she come back from an Amish place? Oh, what the shit? Oh, my hold God. On, hold on. Or am I misremembering? Hold on. Let me see Didn't if I can remember. Because remember, she, kept, she has to kill the clone. <laughs> and, like, they're talking through, like, a door or something. And it's, like, her and the clone are just... <laughs> You're right there. God, I need to call my sister because she'll remember this yeah. shit. Yeah. So, I think we're going to take a <laughs> short break Sarah. because Sarah is dead. We, and we're going to find out about Reva Shane. <laughs> More. Back. We we're going to come back. Yeah. We're going to we're gonna come back to you um, because we've killed Sarah. There's the red Sorry. button. Which button do There's I hit? the red one right there. Okay, we're back. We've saved Sarah. I could not. I could. Sarah like got a little bit. Uh, she got a little bit overall. There were conniptions happening. It was amazing. So I pitched a shot of fit during our break. Used our you know considerable resources to <laughs> research. You mean smartphones? Yeah, the internet. The guiding light. And now I'm remembering <laughs> things. So real quick and dirty. This has nothing to do with. Flowers in the attic, but it has everything I think to do that with. You will care. Yeah. I'll make a connection at the end. Yeah, you will. Yeah, you will. So, okay. So, <laughs> Reva Shane, our hero, other Sarah and I's yes. hero, like she drives off the Seven Mile Bridge <laughs> yep. because of reasons. Just, just reasons. So, Bob, reasons. And I can see a picture in my mind. Oh my mind. god, it's amazing because she's, she's like she crazy. looks like Tombs's the driving cat. Like she's just like ah, and she drives off the bridge. And jo- Joshua. Joshua <laughs> is overwrought. So he goes to a mad scientist and is like, hey, I need you to make me a clone of my bitch. And he's like, fine, we'll do it. We're naming her Dolly. Dolly. <laughs> ah, the 90s were amazing. And I want you to remember that this is not, this is not one of those, this is not passions. This is not <laughs> These Are Lives. This is The Guiding Light, which was our radio fucking show, y'all. Mm-hmm. The Guiding Light was amazing, and I hate everyone for not watching it and making it get canceled. Yeah. Like, I'm still pissed off at all of you motherfuckers, because The Guiding Light was the shit. So, okay, so Joshua has a clone of Reva made, and he keeps her in a cage for a little while, <sighs> because... You need to be careful with me. I am fragile. So, <laughs> he keeps her caged, and then teenage... The teenage Reva Shane is played by another really well-known actress from the show who is Michelle from Danny and Michelle. That's a whole other story. Oh, my God. Michelle was dating the guy that gave her, that her mom, her dead mom gave her heart to, Mm -hmm. but then a monster comes in and, like, has to save Michelle from a whole thing, and they start dating. So, anyway, so Danny and Michelle. Michelle, Bethany Joy Lenz plays... Teenage Reva. It's amazing. So, real Reva comes back after she got washed up on a desert island, and she finds her way back to Joshua. Yes, Joshua. Because you can't keep Reva, Shane, and Joshua apart. Mm -mm. Like, they are soulmates times ten. So, So no Gulf of Mexico gonna do that. No, fuck, no, no, no. Sonny couldn't do it. Annie Dutton couldn't do it. No, Annie Dutton was a... I hated Annie Dutton. <laughs> I still hate Annie Dutton. Also, do you remember what was Reva's sister that like jumped in there too? That fucking stripper sister of hers that like tried to. Br- it wasn't Tangy or something. Tam, no, Tammy was the si- Tammy was the girl's daughter who dated her cousin, who was Reva's son. What was Reva's son name? Not, it, it, no, the crazy one. Um, Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan and oh, Tammy. Yeah. Okay. The right. bad boy. Oh, God. Jonathan. On, had to have a crush on Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan. He was there for us. He was just angry all the time. Okay, anyway. He so, like hell, okay, he wasn't a blonde guy, was he? No, he was dark haired. That's what I He was in about. love with his cousin. He didn't give a shit. It was like super forbidden. He had long hair. He, he oh, that was super jacket. forbidden. It used to be that that was super for fucking bidden. Anyway, okay. So, Reva Shane makes her way back to Joshua. Finds out about the clone and is like, nah, this isn't going to work. The clone Dolly is in love with Joshua, but also (laughs) understands that she is not part of this world. So, (laughs) Joshua, (laughs) they had given... (laughs) If only the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park had had that inside. They had given... Oh, the, please, they, they, make that movie, please. They had given the clone... Please. Hold on. They had given the clone an aging serum. Like, oh to God. make her, like, older faster because Joshua couldn't wait that long. And so, the clone is like, well... 
Reva's gonna have to have him. So I'm gonna OD on this like this aging That's Sarah. What so what ends up happening is yeah. young Reva, like normal age Reva, has to like hold her dying old ass self as she's like passing. It's the most amazing thing. Anyway. Back to Flowers in the Attic. NBC well, before Andrews. we say that, please, back to Jurassic Park via Guiding Light. <laughs> will you make that movie? Oh, we, I mean, where, where well, the, the clones are, are all, all like, stuff aware. all, like, incestuous, like, um, like, <laughs> previous relationships and the Velociraptors, yeah. like, well, not with that bitch because she did this and then... Yeah. Oh, the Velociraptor's please. like, maybe I shouldn't be on this earth. Dear oh, Holly, maybe I'm just going to chew my own arms off. But only mm. if Reva Shane's the queen of the dinosaurs. <laughs> Dear like, Hollywood, I know that you love remakes. Do this for oh me. My God. It would be a good idea. It would be fun. I mean, I, would I, watch love, it. I love the guy. I know you watch it. It'd I mean, be campy as hell, too. I mean, they would have a cult following immediately. I love yeah. the guy. Like, okay. But not if they wanted it. You have to do this in all sincerity if you want a real cult following. You cannot, you cannot, uh, to, to quote Susan Sontag, blah, 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 you can't make camp on a purpose. That's true. That is true. Yeah. But, okay. So, oh, the connection, though. Connection. You wanted to. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's tie it us. all back. People who are confused or upset or just slightly annoyed that we keep talking about the guiding light. We know all of you out there who have seen the show are like loving this. But if you haven't and you're confused and you're upset with us, that's okay. Because we're going to bring it back to Flowers in the Attic. And how that's going to happen. Remember when Corinne brought the kids that TV set? Oh, we didn't even talk about that. Hold on. And do they're, it. they're do all it. watching that do TV it. set, and Kathy's like, "Oh, they're watch. They were watching soaps, and Kathy was like, "Oh, Christopher or something. Our lives are like the soap operas. They never go outside. They, they." True, because you couldn't afford to shoot out there. Yeah, and right when they're on the cusp of something good happening, something bad happens. So Kathy just figures it out. She's like, "Okay, we're a soap opera." She knows we're the guy in light. Yeah. She knows we're the fucking guiding light. But the thing is, you could have never gotten around to fucking your brother if you didn't have a TV to keep the children occupied. And I know that all of you who have kids are like, oh, thank God. And if y'all who don't have kids are like, oh, well, my child will all absolutely follow the American Association of Pediatricians guidelines. I'm not fucking your brother? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, God. that's level two guidelines. I'm not letting your kids see TV. Ah. You get like an hour of screen time if you're four uh, or something. And, and, and that sounds great when you don't have a kid, but when you have a kid, it turns out you got to make dinner. And there's like a whole people who just spend their time writing judgy blogs about this thing. And and how do you ever have time to fuck your brother if you also have <laughs> two twins who are five oh my years God. old I don't on understand your ass? It. Well, well it, took them, three, to it took them three years to fuck. The break, the break they That's caught they got a TV. The twins were, were dying a slow death yeah. of poisoning, That's so true. they probably well, didn't have the And also they energy. had the TV. Yes. So, yeah, they were probably not... Your typical little kids running around. No, I mean on the on the one part, if you don't have a TV, maybe you can't fuck your brother. But if you <laughs> do have a TV, many avenues will open up to you. Okay, That's all I'm saying. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to steer this ship because right now we're just <laughs> bananas. But this whole series is bananas. So it's, yeah, it, 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 the it fact that it's, did you did you get did you bring that home? Did you get the chance to tell us all of that? I'm sorry, I interrupted everything because I suddenly could not get enough oh, no. oxygen oh, to my brain. Oh, oh, the 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 culmination or the ending of Garden of Shadows. Yeah, so basically you've heard everything you need to hear. Alicia spends her time in the attic, so there's that connection. Right. And Olivia becomes very hardened, as we know. And then the we get back to that swamp bed because when Corinne and Christopher Sr. get caught doing the deed that gets them banished from Foxworth Hall, I think, and people can correct me when I'm wrong when they respond to this, but I think they get caught doing it in that swamp bed. Oh, so that swamp, swamp bed, bed has a history. So well, the, the takeaway... the weird thing about that swamp bed is it comes with a bassinet. And and it's just like it's, oh, yeah, it's like a weird right. like kind of a thing, yeah. and I'm like that's got to be important when you see it in the in in the book, but like it's not important in the book. Maybe it's just like a thing on your brain. It's like oh babies, babies, babies. You can't just like you know just go around fucking unless, for example, you had any goddamn sense in your head and you brought your fucking condoms in your diaphragm, which is especially if you're fucking your brother. 
I mean, PSA. Right. But I don't, they probably didn't brother. know that they were brother fucking. Like, I think, like, Corinne probably really thought. They thought it was, they, they thought uncle, it was their half uncle. uncle. Yeah. Because, because the, 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 the Alicia who said secret. half uncle? I mean, who even, who even figures that out? I don't know. So the Alicia secret was the grandmother and Malcolm secret. So right. I guess now you know why. Because, because I mean, part of you is just like you said. You brought yeah, up a good point. Why, hell, like, why? Why are they really losing it so much and like whipping Corinne with a whip over over this half uncle thing? But she doesn't know. That's not fair. Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, because well, nothing they in this know. book is fair. So oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, as my mother would say, life's not fair. Okay. So how old were you when you read the book? I was maybe 12. I wouldn't have been older than 12. That was the right, that, so, that's the age that and then like, would be very familiar. Okay, <laughs> who suggested it to you, do you know? My sister. I am, am lucky to have an older sister who has been somebody I've looked up to. And of course, she's about five years older than me. So mm-hmm. she was actually, so she got it, she was like safely into her teens. She right. wasn't like a tween like me. But she read it and so I took her copy and read it. But my sister, I think my sister read Flowers in the Attic, and then we watched the shitty movie with Christy Swanson, and we were kind of, she was done with it. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, i got to read this whole series. And I would tell so, Ruth, so, my sister, like, how what was happening. So before we, like, jump into that, like, I, I want to read some more of these, like, out. more serious responses that we got. Because some people, like, put really nice things. Like, so somebody wrote, I love it. As a gay man, I think there's a lot in Flowers in the Attic and all of the real V.C. Andrews works to identify with. Forbidden love, persecution from crazy religious bigots, Mm -hmm. being an outsider. In Flowers in the Attic specifically, there is this whole claustrophobic tone to take in. I think there's something there for anyone who feels shut off from life. And I would suggest that, um, you know, for people who feel alienated in general... That a big part of Flowers in the Attic is that the people who are making these decisions, who are falling in love with each other, with their brothers or whatever, they don't, A, have the full information, and B, it's not their fault. Right. Yeah. Like, like, they're always, like, they thrust into a situation, and by these, these terrible, usually religious persecutors... Mm-hmm. I mean, I completely understand why um, a, a, a gay man would really feel... And this one know. I like, too, because, again, this is kind of goes back to the whole tenor of what our podcast is about. about. When I first read it, I remember I loved it. It made me feel very grown up. Not only the themes, but probably also due to the fact that I had snuck it off my grandmother's bookshelf. Woo! In hindsight, though, I realized I probably would not have to, had to sneak it. My media consumption was not remotely supervised by my parents. Rereading Flowers again in college, it struck me more than anything that I probably should not have been reading it at all. Yeah. I'm a big believer in fiction being well fiction and people reading and writing what they want and like. But part of me cannot help but feel that Flowers affected me in a negative way, reading it as young as I did. And then, I love it. Though it's not my favorite V.C. Andrew book, V.C. Andrews book, I think her melodrama somehow gets at the emotional reality of trauma better than any serious drama and also provides some escapism through her prose and storytelling. I love Kathy to Helen back. Her personality shows all of the ugliness, all of the hate and anger, but all of the tenderness, all of the vulnerability, all of the need to be something, love something, do something that trauma leaves you with. There is a huge yearning in Kathy. So, like, I love that you guys, like, and again, this is one of the reasons that we had you on, because, like, you read this as a as a kid, and this is an important book for you, good or bad, and, like, for us, like, we're reading it as adults, and you guys really put your hearts into these comments, and so, oh yeah, like, as much as we're laughing and, like, having a good time with it, like, I want to treat this, like, like, this is a little bit of a love letter to V.C. Andrews and Flowers in the Attic because this is a book that's important to people. Well, what I think is really interesting is that, okay, so this book is exactly as old as you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who is really old and nowhere near <laughs> as old as me and Courtney, right? <laughs> so Sarah is one year older than Your me and Courtney. coming. However, well, Sarah's... Yeah like five months older than Courtney. The, 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 the audience for this book does not move forward with this book. No. The audience for this book was continually exactly the same age and it was a bit younger and probably I, I think what's than the person. So mm-hmm. great about it is I feel like, because when we asked like who suggested, like this book is suggested. It's a pass along. Well, yeah, and it's, it's, it's suggested 
by people that you care about. Like, no, but like, no strangers. Like, hey, read this book. Or, like, you know, <laughs> like, no, but that like, at the same time, I was like, this, this is like before the internet when the internet yeah, was like, hey, read this a book. Is like, a pass along, but like, they're yeah. friends. And I mean, and this is going to out me as like one of those like earth mother ladies. Um, it's a pass along plant. Like, yeah. Days, at least in all our pass along plants. Well, yeah. It's a pass along book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Absolutely. you got it because somebody else gave it to you. Yeah, yeah. So somebody is important to yeah. you and cares These about you. These things make it a circuit. Mm-hmm. Like, they yeah. were all like, did you read this? Did you read And I had never it's read just very, this. It's very in the same vein to me as like. A Judy Bloom or like. Yeah. S.E. Mm-hmm. Hinton, The Outsiders. Like, those books that were like, again, had this like sort of lurid feel forever. to them. And you read forever now and you're like, oh my um, god, this is so positive, it's amazing. And like, <laughs> you know? but yeah, like, and it's like, for me, like, The Outsiders was like such a thing and like, you yeah, know, it, it has that same feel to it. Like, but where, see, The Outsiders didn't have that, that thing of uh, forbidden to it. And the funny thing is, okay, But I think it, like, I feel like there was like, what The Outsiders had, that like, this is overt. But yeah. like with the outsiders, it's all implication. There's so much implication. It's also male. Well, I think mm-hmm. it's male, but often like it's male through a female lens. Yeah, because that's the difference. A woman. Yeah, it's she's a woman, amazing. and like there's there's definite implication. Like yeah. she's never overt about things, but there is sexuality in that book. Whereas this is dirty. This is. I don't but think, I mean, like the the outsiders is dirty, but in a more subtle way. Like there's obviously you can write about like some bro boys, love happening. You can write about boys in a different way. When you read about girls, it yeah. is either like a soap opera kind of lurid, or it is yeah. a forbidden lurid. Yeah, like I, I don't know how this actually made it through because so many. But books then they were told like they, they were like, "Hey, they told her like at first they're like, you need to juice this up a little bit." So like they told her to make it more. Yeah, and she's like, "Okay, fine." Obviously, if she could do it in a night, she knew exactly so, what she wanted to do with it. So what was it? Do you think about this book that drew you in? Like what? But Drew, man, I really appreciated the comments that you read that other people shared about the books because it kind of reminded me of sort of how I I thought about the book because we've been doing a lot of heckling when, you know, when Reva Shane got into the story. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but that sort of brought me back down to, like, what I was thinking when I was 12. And I, I'm telling you, it was... You have a lot of, you have two extremely cruel female characters in this story, the mother and the grandmother. And to me, that was a foreign concept for me because I was lucky enough to have extremely sweet, awesome grandmothers and my mom's very sweet and awesome. And so the, I, the concept of how these children ended up in this situation just kind of blew my mind. Mm-hmm. So that was the immediate thing that drew me in. Like, how does this happen? But the fact that I was also coming of age, you know, you have a lot in common. I was also kind of sassy. I was a lot like Kathy in that sense. I was definitely no ballerina, and I was definitely not crazy and blonde and like Kathy physically. Uh, right. but, but yeah. You were crazy and blonde. But... <laughs> Well, I no, was, yeah, started no. dyeing my hair when I was in the seventh grade. But anyway, I yeah, I just I like the fact that she was strong and that mm-hmm. she was fighting back and that she slapped her mother back. You know, the fact that she was figuring it out first. And you know, Christopher had his good attributes too, but he was really just a goody goody who was wanting to see the good in the mother. And you you liked that he was sort of hope and I think at the beginning of the book is she talking about sunshine or the color yellow or yeah something? it's the color yellow is the color of hope yeah it's like she talks and it's part of her like memoirs like when mm-hmm. she starts and I you know I remember just because you know I, I read it recently um and that we didn't color them yellow because it was the color of hope yeah and it was like bullshit but it was also you yeah, know but but to my mind kind of to, to, like, to, to my be a 12 year old is not bullshit like no. it's like yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're everything when you are that age is like ramped up to 11 yeah. to my mind that was important to me because i remember i had a baton um competition and you know girls about that age you're just starting your menstrual cycle right and I had, I had been twirling since I was six years old. So my 
my life as a twirler was without this menstrual shit, right? <laughs> and when that came in, it sort of wrecked me and my ability, I felt, to, like, compete. And I never will forget, like, I was losing my mind, it's, you know, crying. I can't tell my mom, I can't do this. And she just looked at me like, kid, you got a long way to go with this. <laughs> yep. You might as well get used to it. And that... That was the kid who was reading flowers in the attic. Mm-hmm. So when I read this, like, yellow is the color of hope, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. that meant something to me. Yeah. And there's a reason I still remember. How many times have I repeated it? We lived in the attic. Christopher, Corey, Carrie, and me. Now there are only three. That will stay in my mind for the rest of my life. You know? And don't you think that maybe a <laughs> bit of why gothic is such a big deal for women, and I understand that we have a lot of male readers, but um, maybe for women is that if you take femalehood and you bottle it down and you squish it hard enough, it, it, it pops out to this, like, big dark house. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's like, always a big dark house. Yeah. Like, it's gonna be, you know, <laughs> that, that, that if you make it so much more intense and you if you multiply your feelings, which your feelings when you're a teenager are yeah. so incredibly intense, that what you end up is is something that can only exist in a big dark house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I, I and I'm not sure that it's an um you know a weird accident because um, people who love dark shadows, for example, mm-hmm. are women and gay men whose feelings are mm, and it makes sense in this big dark house. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah. you're so squished down that, like, the only thing that, like, makes this sort of um, allegory make mm-hmm. sense is if it is so extreme. Is mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Because when you're a kid, my mother hates me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not allowed to do anything. It has to be in extremes. Like, that's yeah. the thing. You can't really, you're so young and you're so, again, hormone that, like, Nothing other than extremes will talk to you. You know, like mm-hmm. there's no room for subtlety. I actually read a thing once about how the reason why the music that you love when you're that age is the music that you love for the rest of your life is that you will never respond to it any other music that way because you are primed with your hormones yeah. mm-hmm. and everything to just receptor. So guess what? Friday I'm in love. Exactly. <laughs> and oh, and right, right around that time too, rock set was big. Right? Oh my god! Oh and my I god. remember it might have been Petals in the Wind that I was reading by that time. But remember that song, Fading Like a Flower. Oh yeah. my god! Yes. Yeah. And I mean, when <laughs> if if Tori Amos ever comes. <laughs> Yeah. To North Carolina. No, I get, and it, I get like, some. Yeah, well, yeah, it's gonna I, happen. I, you know, what? I associated though that Roxette song specifically with this because yeah. it was the fading like the flower weird, like, in my little tween heart. Yeah, that and, was so important to me. You feel that so if, hard if about you that think song. About you about the about things ever. that we yeah. love so hard, like like flowers. <laughs> of, flowers in the attic is the feminine version of the crow. Yes, like, yeah. like how yes. gothic and how. How much we feel like again? The crow is a thing that I still like. Like you're like the the it's yeah. It's a story of revenge. But like you know, yeah. like, but, but, but it's That's a story of, of do, revenge and like how like the synonymous is like yeah. you know we lived in the attic. Like that quote versus like it can't rain all the time. Like it's oh still something a thing you say and you everybody fucking knows. Like it can't rain all the time. Like it's so gothic and lurid and just. Love and yeah, you know. you're so simple at the time. Yeah, yes. I mean, you don't want to admit it. You want to think that you are so. And I had a friend recent, like yeah. I had a friend. <laughs> so I had a friend who's my age watch The Crow for the first time as an adult, and like oh, don't do that. Well, like he was, it was like he's like, oh, it's fine. It's you know, it's entertaining. I'm like, no, it's important. It's everything. Yes. Like this movie yes. is important. So like, like you know, and I talked to a friend of mine who like saw it the same age and like is as addicted. My friend who's like the. That I described as the Angela Chase. Like, she yeah. was like, no, it's important. Like, you <laughs> must love it. You must love it as much as we love it. So, I love like, I guess crow. that's like a way I can associate. Cause again, <laughs> and then, see, like, so my husband is nine years older than I am. And I think there's a thing. Yeah. You have to have imprinted, like, a duckling yes. on a thing right. that was then there. Mm-hmm. Because he is never going to get something that, that, that did not get him at the time. Right. And exactly. I'm not going to get something that did not. So, Blue Oyster Cult, I think, is his at the right. time thing. <laughs> hey, sweetie. And, like, for us, it's you like, know? yeah, like, The Cure. And, yeah. you know, like, God, do you, re- you, you remember, like, 
God, I can't mm-hmm. remember the, the song, but like, our like music, our music, STP, like Stone Temple Pilots, like, what was, it, what was the plush? Yeah. Like when you listen to plush and it was like, shit, no one gets it no. more than Radiohead <laughs> doing Creep. And then you found yeah, out that like... it was like, I'm so fucking special. <laughs> yeah, like... And it like ruined your world and, and made so, it yeah, like, this time. is like that. It's like, I mean, obviously this book came out in the like 79, but like this book I will always like put with the 90s. Yeah, it mm-hmm. travels with a generation yeah. and it does never get older. It's like a vampire book. Yeah. Like it never gets older. Well, yeah, it t- you know, it was sort of like the, um, like the um, oh, what are the vampire novels? Uh, and rights? Uh, no, um, that Remember the kids Academy? read. Vampire Academy. Twilight. Well, oh, the Twilight. Book. Yes, yeah. the Twilight. Um, I didn't read that, but I feel like there was that. And for them, was, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always a thing. Yeah, there's, there's always a thing. A thing. That is your, and you think if something is romantic, that is deeply disturbing to people who are older than you. By the way, it's not cool if a dude creeps in your bedroom and wants you to sleep without your <laughs> right. permission. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't read any of the Twilight books, but I know people my age who did, who really enjoyed them, and I watched the movies, and I enjoyed them. I, actually, I read them, and I found them. Uh, the first one, mm-hmm. I was at 2 in the morning. I was reading that Wait, like it's a, ta- it's a page turner, and I think it's a page turner in the same I way. I like feel BC. good. I, I felt But like it's Weezy, the same but... page turner in the way that B.C. Andrews is. Like, yeah, I think it touches those yes. nerves. That, that connects yeah. you. It, it gets you the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there's always a thing. I don't know what it is these days. Like, what? Readers. Yeah, what are the Tell kids? Tell us. What are the kids reading? What are the yeah. kids reading? So, I mean, I, I get, like, uh, our, our audience, so what are your kids reading? So, do you remember, like, do a, did a lot of your friends read it as well? Because, yeah. like, that's the thing we and talked we about. And we were talking about it in halls. huddled circles. We yeah. Were, we were talking about it in huddled circles, and we were... You know, sharing books. I had them all, I think. So my sister gave me uh, Flowers in the Attic, and then I got the rest of them at the, in the book section in the Walmart in the mm-hmm. next town over. Did you find that cut-up cover to be as fascinating as I did? Like, yeah. the concept of, like... I yeah. remember seeing... I yeah. remember vividly that cover, even though I never read the books. Yeah, I remember, yeah. like... I think my mom had the book, and I remember the cover... And I was like, that whole, like, you open it up. And it was like yeah. a secret. Yeah. It was like a, like, it was like a little, like, The idea secret. of the book, yeah, yeah. And my mother would have never had that book. But somehow I still, somehow yeah, knew like, the cover. Again, it was like this really. was too good for this book. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely captivating in that way, the cover was. And, and, and we were I always I am fine, ta- by the way, with this podcast lasting as long as it does. Because this is, like, the thing. This, this is, is what the, we do. Like, I feel like this, this is, is probably the, the most. This and, like, our the, whole. The whole point of, like, what we talked about, again, is, like, somebody actually put it in the comments about, like, taking taking something from your grandmother that, like, you're not supposed to have. And, like, it making you feel this like an so adult. This is so close to the bone. This yeah. is so vital. And in, in to the sense that you and I both had, like, a bad night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even though you yeah. had read it before. We there, had a bad night. There are a few things from my from like a few things that I was totally into from my childhood that still yeah. give me nightmares. Oh yeah. And this is one of them. I mean, this is not the obvious one. The obvious one is uh, Michael Myers. Every once in a while I'll have a Halloween Michael Myers dream where I'm running from Michael Myers. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's so obvious. But the flowers in the attic dream is the dream. I would have dreams like that around the time that I was reading the book. It's complicated, and, isn't it? And all these years later, I start thinking about these books, maybe putting a few notes together. I love that your few notes together is like <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're gonna take a picture of it. <laughs> and I, I just go to sleep, and I wake up, and I'm like, motherfuckers, I had a flowers in the attic dream, and it was so creepy. Help. I feel like it's complicated. (laughs) I mean, like, if I had read this at the time, and tell me what you think about this, because this is obviously a terrible thing that's happening to these kids, but their relationship is maybe delicate. Mm -hmm. It's, but yet it's rapey, Mm -hmm. but yet, I I I really rated for complicated. It's tragic because they didn't get a chance to know. Right, like, but uh, but did you want them to? I mean, because yeah, they were brother and sister. You kind of wanted them to be together. At least I did in Flowers in the Attic. Well, because basically, when she gets we and that solidifies after the fact because Paul is is a creep. I mean, Paul's not written as a creep, but you get that about it. Right. And then, those are definitely not children in the attic and you're hearing in the background. <laughs> and, We've got some children in the attic <laughs> walking around. <laughs> yeah. You can have some children. 
Children. I'm sorry. I love um, uh, Night at the Hunter. <laughs> uh, that's my jam. Uh, no, you can have some more. That's fine. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> Say hello. Oh, he knew about he knew about the scene, or he knew about word. the section no. where yeah. um, where it's Catherine easy. got tarp stuck in her hair. Yeah, so my husband, who just walked through and got wine and, like, refused to say anything, <laughs> he has never read the books, but he knows enough. Like, again, it's something that's so entrenched in our cultural memory that he was like, oh, yeah, that's the book where he's just, like, what did he say? He's like, she got asphalt. asphalt. Every, yeah, yeah, every guy our age knows at least something about flowers. Because you yeah, because well, every girl and you want to know Because we used yeah. to read it out loud. It was a big deal. Was a huge like, because, deal. because the boys wanted to know like, what's going on? It was the soap opera. Yeah. I mean, but I find that so interesting. The whole thing with the hair. Because obviously, even within the context of the book, it is like ridiculous. Her hair was like a yeah. down to straw after what yeah. happened to it. And, and she like, Christopher- off the front third. But it was her uh, hanging on to her body. But also, like, mm-hmm. Christopher, like, staying up all night and, like, mixing compounds like, and, he's, like... he's doing everything he can, and it's... And that's that's a gesture of love right there. Yeah. Yes. And, like, you I know mean, that they're good obviously... Good love is 100%. Yeah. Now, whether it's good love or bad love, I mean, you know... <laughs> Oh my god, I was so I was so there for it. I was so there for the Christopher Kathy because, love. Because I mean, like the person who stands by you no matter what. Yeah. yeah. And you know, quite frankly, oh yeah, you think we're gonna do it? Fine, fuck you, we won't do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Julian in in the second book that that Julian kind of figures out there's something crazy going on yeah. between because he's he's so jealous that Kathy can never completely give herself to him. What's holding you back from my hunky ballet guy? Well, what do you think is, like, behind that, really? And like, what, what is the deep psychology there? But between Julian and Kathy, or... Between all the whole thing, do you oh. think? I mean, maybe you get imprinted on a guy, or do you think... Are that, you talking like, about, like the, like, the difference, like, what's... I feel like, obviously... I got mistreats her this way, whereas the guy who does mistreat her a different way... But I mean, like, I, again, you have never had an experience with her. Like when you have lived through like a concentration I, camp right. or something, can you ever really take somebody who has not lived with you seriously? Right. I, well, she she can't she can't really give herself to anybody else, and and she. But Julian, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. He's but I do have to say, like, like, I do have to say, like, it is hard. Like, this is not anywhere near the same kind of trauma. But like, being somebody who like. Has survived, like you know, having a late term stillbirth. Like again, my son oh, passed. Like, but, but that my, is completely legitimate. You should not. You like my son passed when you like essentially was forty weeks. Like you know, at full term. And so, like I do, I know for myself. Speaking to this, like I have a really hard time when like people come to me and say this is the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with, and it's like another situation. I have to be like. I have to take a step back and, like, realize, like, my, my, my 10, my 11 is not everyone else's. Like, you know, pain is, like, it's a measurement that's, like, not the same. And so it is really difficult to be, like, to empathize with certain things. So I can see where Kathy probably, I mean, again, they're two, like, it's completely different things. But, like, when you've dealt with such a monumental amount of pain... And people come to you with like their bullshit, and you're like, it's like you're, you're like, this, my toe feel you're like this me. is yeah. fucking bullshit. Yeah. Like, so it is. I can say for someone who has dealt with like a certain kind of trauma, it is really difficult to like be all there for something else. Yeah, like you know, you know, like when you're dealing with when people are telling you shit, and you're like, this is some hot fucking nonsense, yeah. and like you kind of become less. You, you, because you're a little bit of a harder person. Do you worry about that, that you've become less... I think what I've worried about, like, the thing is, like, I know that I'm probably a little bit harder, like, because I'm, f- like, fucking made of steel. You can't break me. And I love, like, I really like that about myself, but also, like, I have to realize, like, not everybody is that way. Mm-hmm. And so like I have to be like because I don't ever want to be a cruel person or a callous person. So I have to know like okay, you're coming to me with like legitimate pain and like you're really in pain. And because my pain is so much what I can like perceive like as a greater pain, like I can't discount 
that, you know? So it's well, how do you feel? Um, it's just a thing that you have to be really, I think you have to be conscientious you, about. With the dog snoring in the background. My dog. Mm-hmm. How, how, how do you feel? And I understand what people are saying. When, they, when you tell them, like, a horrible thing happened to me and somebody died. Mm-hmm. And it is to them an equivalent. So they say to you, my dog died. No, nope. I've been very, very fortunate, and like nobody has tried to do that. Like, but at the same time, I feel like people because they're giving you the I, people want to like from a people, false place. But here's the thing: I think people want to try to find a way to connect. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I feel like again, like bringing it back to flowers in the attic. We're all trying to find connections, and so maybe people don't go about it the most eloquent way, but I'm never going to judge somebody. Like, I'll judge you if you ignore the fact that it doesn't happen. Like, if you just completely ignore the fact that I had a son, like, that's going to make me angrier than you, like, bringing up, like, well, I know how I felt when, like, my dog died. Like, like they're trying to forge a connection. Yeah, I mean, like, and that's a legitimate and, thing on their and path. And I feel like, again, like, they're not being an asshole. Well, I, I like kind of, like, Kathy and Chris and rooted for them is, like, they... They needed a connection. They need right. somebody who connect with, and nobody can understand what they went through better than that other person. That's true. And yeah. so, like, I think that's the other thing about this book. And you know, one of the like my last questions is like, what do you think about this book resonates with people? And I do think it's connection. Like mm-hmm. for all the yeah. intense, like for all I the agree. crazy outside forces and bananas shit that is happening, and like haircuts and beatings and stuff. It's about to me, this brother and sister, because Carrie and Corey were sort of like these interlopers in it. Like yeah. they were in the book, but they yeah. were just they were just in the book. They were the thing you had. They could have been dogs. Or yeah, horses, or like but it's else. about yeah. Kathy and, and Chris, Chris. Mm-hmm. and they had a thing that they had to take care of. Right. It could have been yeah. seedlings. Who even gave her ass ass? Yeah, know? exactly. So yeah. I think it's it's all about connections. And I think that's probably why people, because again, especially when you're this age. Oh, yeah. And you're just all hormone. You're learning empathy. You're learning her empathy yeah. and you're learning, like, you want to connect with people because we all feel like outsiders. We all feel like, and yeah. that's one of the things, like, before you I came in. I would love to get, and I wonder if I could even... You know, maybe I should, like, go look at my high school yearbook and see if I could call these people who are probably still here because guess what? Life is like that in yeah. North Carolina. And say, okay, what did you think? Because, yeah, like, I, I thought that you were the top of the heap. I thought that you were doing, you know, you... <laughs> but what did you think of life? You probably thought life was fucking shitty. <laughs> Yeah. You thought, you know, I thought that I, I was, you know, second to last on, on that, that, that scale. And I thought that my life is terrible. But I bet that you also thought that your life was terrible for many of the same reasons. But I didn't get it, you know? And like, mm-hmm. what did you think when you were the same age? I thought that, I, I think what Courtney said was absolutely true about the connections in the story. And for all the heckling and all the hindsight that we have now about the situation, the relationship between Kathy and Christopher, you know. I don't even think that the incest matters. Well, it, it didn't really, you know. It's it, itself beside the point. We're, well, yeah, it's crazy because they're, they're basically forced to be the twins' parents. They're and, forced into a mother father right. role. So and big so, surprise that they end up being the mother and father. So much so that the twins withdraw from the actual mother, from Corin, and won't even go to Corin when she comes <laughs> to visit you? them. Right. And so, I mean, it's Christopher's blood they're drinking. It's Kathy who's <laughs> taking care yeah. of them. Yeah. And, and, and Christopher's trying to catch mice for them. I mean, well, to eat, right? Yeah, he's going to eat them. And then yes. they end up then, with the pet mouse. Then they end up with the pet mouse. But, yeah, so they're really forced to become adults before their time. They're not really given a chance. Which is what you think your life is, though, when you're mm-hmm. that age. Yeah. I mean, like, I get this, this, this feeling. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I was, uh, I was saying that what you brought up with the relationships and the connections is so important and really drills down, I think, to the essential element. I mean, we can talk about all the themes all day, but without... Kathy and Christopher. Yeah, they're the glue. There's nothing. There's nothing else that yeah, like, that's gonna keep. And so it's kind of like I wanted like Kathy to go out in a blaze of glory, but like obviously if Christopher dies, Kathy is like 
void. And I mean, that's so, sad to say, but like at the same time, they've been so connected in things. So mm-hmm. what? What if um, the same book had been true and they were completely for unrelated kids? I mean, I think obviously, point. if they had been unrelated. Because I just their poor. previous life was sort of like void. It didn't matter. Do you think it would have been like Hunger Games and they would have just killed and eaten each other? <laughs> well, I mean, it is interesting. No, like, I mean, not I literally don't. Hunger Games. I don't. I don't. I really <laughs> don't. I don't. Because I think that the older kids would have assumed the same parental roles. I mm-hmm. really do. Because people do that. I mean, that's what I think is funny about this whole idea yeah. of the apocalypse. And like, oh, we're going to eat each other. No, you're going <laughs> to still want a pharmacist. You're going to still. You don't want to, yeah. What like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I do think people it's interesting to think about. Like, communities are sort of a sweet, generous thing that people want to be among yeah. other people with relationships. Mm-hmm. So, I don't, yeah. I, I think if they were non related, I think it was still, like, it wouldn't have had the same, like, Resolve. Yeah, like golfing well, nature, resolve. but like you still would have been like for it. You'd have been like, oh, yeah. yes. Like, yeah, obviously, do it. Like, do it. Yes. Get it. Hop on that. But it would have made it like, I feel like it would have been cheating because like the point of it is, is to like, in spite of them being brother and sister, you right. want them to be together. I mean, because that and was so, absolutely part of it. Is that yeah. You were supposed to want, it was putting you in a position where yes, you like you you want a thing the, that's like dirty. And, like, and it goes back to like, like we we're talking about. Like it's the trick, it's a trick. Well, like with the, like with Stephen King and like the running a train scene, Lord. basically. But the thing is, is like when you're twelve, you know what's wrong, and like when you're twelve, your mind is much more open to fucked up things, and like you want, you want that. To be you want you want to feel dirty. You, you want to feel to wrong. Understand and, like, what older women and like if you think know. about like what our versions of like at twelve of dirty and wrong are. Like mm-hmm. yes, this nonsense book. Which it isn't could be a, nonsense, a whole lot worse. It could be like if you look at the garbage world that we live in. Yeah. Like again, <laughs> Stephen <laughs> King writing I a moved really on like a bitch. When you're rich, you can do anything. Yeah, you like when Stephen, thing. like yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Stephen King's like whole Beverly, like you can rape him in the swamp bed if you're Malcolm yeah. Foxworth. Me and I, like but, uh, she she chose that. She assented <laughs> to that. But you know what I mean? Like I feel like the things that we think. And, again, we look at it from adult eyes and say, this is wrong. But you know what? There's a lot more shit out but, there you know, way you're, worse. You're also taught, and this is a thing in it, um, that that you as a woman have some, uh, because, of course, there's classes. There's, like, thief, ranger, knight, girl. Yeah. But girl can give a blessing. Well, the, the nice thing is, like. And the, the blessing was part of it. You know, is it like um, the, the, as a woman, it was it was her choice, and she chose to bless this. I feel like there's a lot of well, there's a, I feel like there's a lot of tie-ins this between. Pedophile what, it's not even a pedo- like yeah, I guess because an adult man wrote it, but at the same time, there's a lot of tie-ins between like flowers in the attic, I think, and it because it's if so you think about taking control of this, if you think about in it, like the whole thing was like their thing about like it came as your biggest fear. Yeah. And you know what Bev does is like basically like to take some power back to empower yeah. herself and Yes, absolutely. And I get that Stephen King has gotten better at this, but it was always adult writing about adult women was his. Uh, but you know, like I again, yeah. I'm I'm gonna defend it. Like but I you don't know, hate. Good it. about reading girls. Like, don't put it. Don't put it. Obviously, in the remake or the movie. Like no. obviously, it's not a thing you put in that. But in the book, it works. I agree. No, I will stand for that, and you know what? You can come at me, because I don't Twitter, so I ain't got no It's me. Me Y'all are coming for me. I don't Twitter either. (laughs) But no. I'm just a guest. I thought it was amazing when I read it. Yeah, because, like, she talks about it, because, like... She vital loses, to me. She loses her virginity not to one of the main two. It's she like, loses them all. But like I think it's like Ed, like whoever like takes her virginity. I think it might have been like Eddie or what like it wasn't the the fat dude with no, the bigger penis. It wasn't was Ben. Gross. Ben was not. But the thing is, is Ben's the one she ends up with. The bill is a sweet. I how it, it's a thing. I don't want to go into the minutia because it's but still like gross it's, it's when it, you think but, about it. it, it, it but at the same time, we're, it is her we're, power is about her power. We remember this how many years after the fact, no, like that we read about this. Her power yeah. is about her her ownership of the situation. It yeah. is about ah, uh, and I feel weird. But like, no, yeah. I am in support of that sound. Only, but only if you read it before a certain date. <laughs> 
Anyway, I know we're, we're getting like, like. No, it matters. It matters a lot. It does it matter. Is and I think it is relevant. It's important. And I think our readers, either they don't care or they do care. If they do care, they're going to be with us. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I do think it is like for Flowers in the Attic. I think it's an, I think it's really easy to dismiss this as being soap opera nonsense. And it is fun to do that because it is soap opera nonsense. It's titillating. It's really titillating and it is crazy and amazing and like banana stories. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, this is something that like caught fire and was important to people. people. And so it is important to like treat it with... But that it's important, important yeah. not I to agree. a, I think it's fascinating, it's not important to a generation, it's important to a specific <laughs> age group. Right. Yeah. Like, so, like, it's a time traveling thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, if you are 13. But see, like, I wonder if, like, 13 year old girls are like flowers in the attic. Like, mm-hmm. I hope. I mean. I don't know. I don't know any of them now. Yeah, I don't know. So. My kid's four, so he's really into, um, nothing. Yeah, mine's four. <laughs> She's Daniel Tiger. She's yeah. telling Daniel Tiger. Oh fuck Daniel Tiger. She likes oh. all the she likes all the things on Netflix. See, and he, she is, does love PBS Kids. Oh, she's like Martha Speaks is her big thing right now. See, she's moved on from Daniel. We have a, a encourage our child to love OG Mr. Rogers because um fuck <laughs> that Daniel Tiger shit. It's all about conform, 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 and fuck that shit. But also you like PJ Masks <laughs> and True is a thing now. Like, oh my god. Yeah, I've watched a little bit of the True and I I'm I don't know what's going on. Yeah, well, I have you get three wishes. Uh huh. So um it's auto tuned. You can get and some auto tuned business. <laughs> <laughs> well um Netflix did um a new Anne of Green Gables series. Yeah. Oh, I was in it and until... I, there's a lot more trauma, it, it, and I like the yeah. trauma. And I watched no, it. I hated it. But see, at the same time, like, honestly, what do you think Anne is going to have to deal with in real... Like, I like that... I don't... I don't like that, like... It's made up. It's so made I up. I gotta say, like, How, I, I mean, I, I love Anne of Green Gables so much, and I... I don't like Gilbert going to the Caribbean, but, but like... <laughs> but, like, I, I have to oh, say, like, not. the new one isn't bothering me. It didn't bother me. I like but, the idea... Why not? I'm why sorry. Not? Why not? Because I just love Anne so much. And oh, I like the, the idea Captain because, like... Anne. But amazing. But, I mean, I, but I, see, I, love, I, love, I love the character of I Anne. Like, love I love the idea the of Anne. Anne. I well, love see, what if, Anne is. This... And so, there's really no yeah, way you can I, fuck her I, up. I, I've recently there's an unrealistic expectation that Anne of Green Gables, who, like, you know, was, like, hanging out in orphanage, orphanages until she was, like, 11 or 12, had no trauma. So, I do, like, you're, no, you're trying like to put that. some trauma behind but it. But like, they're making drama about, like, uh, people stealing this and that. That's not I mean, what it's about. I mean, like, de- delivering babies. Okay. And so, I, I, like, I think we should probably, yeah. because this is going to be 14 hours long. Ah. But I have so, things to say. It's well, so we many have things to we say have Anna Green Gables. Well, we're gonna have an Anna Green Gables I'm like sorry, mini the only series. Reason one, I brought it you know up what? is because it's one of the adult things that I've not. It's not an adult thing. I but it's, you what. it's it's one of the like not cartoony things that I've yeah. let my daughter watch. We're gonna and do, she loves it and she says let, let's do Anna Green Gables. There's one. We're gonna bring our friend Renee on who is yes. obsessed with we Anna Green Gables. We will have a panel discussion about Anna Green Gables. Anna Green Gables. Like we're gonna talk about the mini series. Like Renee. Lewis will be here. Can there and be a drinking game? Yes. yes. For, and let me say, I'm sorry. every time he says, I'm sorry, and you've I'm got sorry. to do something. Yes, it's yeah. Be well, we will yeah. do Anna Green Gables, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, we are completely here for that, because yes. I think that our... Well, think when after yes. the actor that played Gilbert passed, I read a really good article that talked about him, and saying, like, he was all, all of our, like, again, with it's... This all ties in. It all ties in. I love in. the competitiveness between him and Anne. I love it. 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 Legitimately but, but, love it together. But ah. the thing is, it's like they talked about after that <laughs> actor who played him passed. They said like, the thing is, it's like he was all for all of us, like our age range. He was our first boyfriend. Oh God, yeah. No, fuck him, Mr. Rochester. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm the weirdo. Yeah, of well, course. I sure. was kind of obsessed with the Goblin King, but oh, oh, it's yeah, obviously. <laughs> it is tight. Yes. All right. All right. All right. We gotta we gotta wrap it up. We gotta wrap it up. This is And that's where we ran out of storage. I honestly don't know how much longer we talked. It could have been an hour. It could have been a moment. Um, we obviously had a lot to say, uh, but it's probably a mercy that that stopped when it did. Uh, thank you all for listening. 
Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it, and we really appreciate all of you who bothered to put so much work into your uh, survey answers and put so much heart and effort into discussing with us and inter uh, interacting with us about this crazy book. Um, keep tuned for next time when we will be talking about the first Barnabas Collins book by Marilyn Ross in the Dark Shadows line of extremely cheap paperback novels. America's grooviest ghoul.